Welcome to Retrologic episode 86. I'm Sam Wagers here with Dan Caparello and John Cummins and our special guest, Eric, from the All In podcast. Uh, how are you guys doing? So good. So good, too. So it's better. Been, it's been crazy trying to get the show to happen, but I'm somehow we're all here now, which is great and wonderful. The four um, horsemen of the podocalypse. It, yeah. Let me tell you, it was total chaos in my household. It has been for a little while, but I had like car trouble yesterday. And yeah, are you to okay, out. man? Oh, yeah. John, are you okay over there? You're going to yeah, struck by no. lightning? Yeah. I missed my opportunity to say so good turbo. So now we're just <laughs> hitting thunder. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Anyway, total chaos in my home, which meant like I wasn't going to make it last night, and you guys tried to do a show, and then you didn't do a show, and then tonight you were like, okay, we're doing a Tuesday, and I'm like, oh, cool, I can make it now. So now we're here trying to do a show. Sam's hosting. I'm going to just try to keep up. <sighs> Welcome to Retro Logic. <laughs> Yeah, and, and no doubt this there's a lot of chaos to go around, and it may seem like that. But you know what? For me, it's Tuesday. Oh, uh, nice. And nice. I had to drop that reference because we were talking later reference? about some fighting games, even though that's more specifically a reference to a movie based on a fighting game. But that movie, based on a fighting game, also had a fighting game. Yes. Yes, it did. Gosh. Why am I here? So, <laughs> With all that said, (laughs) RetroLogic is not just a podcast. It is a whole community of retro gamers. Uh, You can visit RetroLogic.games for links to the Discord, the merch, our wonderful fair trade t-shirts, blog posts written by Sam Wagers, that's me, um, as well as our whole family of podcasts, including RetroGroove, now starting a new season. Mm -hmm. Um, Crazy. Music history podcast hosted by our very own Adam and Liam. Uh, check that out. Always worth a listen. Um, as well as On Topic Retro hosted by John, uh, where we focus on specific games. Um, speaking of On Topic Retro, what's coming up on that, John? Uh, tomorrow night, I'll be recording a episode on Alien Hominid, and I believe... I'll have the other Caparello on for that one, if he's still good for that. Oh, yeah. And maybe, Adam and maybe is, one special guest. Adam is a super fan of um, of Alien Hominid. He hasn't played in a long time, but he's got some some love to pour into that episode. So I hope you guys are ready. <laughs> Didn't you recently do an episode on Bomberman for On Topic Retro? I can't yes. remember. That yeah, sounds like that would be an amazing great. episode that all of your listeners should definitely check out. Yes, that was that was a uh, that was an explosive episode for sure. We had, we had a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I need some symbols over here. <laughs> well, let's just get right into our usual icebreaker. What have we been buying? Uh, what have we been playing, Eric? Since you are our guest, you can go first. If there's anything retro or non-retro that you've picked up lately that you want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> Go right Before ahead and do so. Eric does that, can Eric just wax poetic about his amazing podcast that he's on for a second? I sure. just love to hear about it. I can do. I can. I'm not as good at haikus as you are, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I can definitely try to get a little Shakespearean up in here just for you guys. But yes, I am all in. Eric from All In, a Nintendo podcast, the weekly Nintendo variety show where each and every Saturday, no shell is left unturned, no point is left unearned. Me and my amazing co-host, $2 Hero, the amazing Seth, put together a weekly variety show all about the world of the big and all about the world of the red brand. We do a ton of retro style stuff. We do a lot of retrospectives, weekly top fives. We do indie showcases every week. We have amazing developer and industry interviews all the time. We recently talked to Stephen Frost from Digital Eclipse about the upcoming TMNT Cowabunga collection and the Atari 50th anniversary celebration. We've always got amazing stuff going on. Uh, Definitely check it out. We release an episode every Saturday. We're up to episode 115. We also have a Patreon, which you should definitely check out. Patreon.com slash all in podcast, where we do a whole other dang show that we call all in side quest. As a matter of fact, we recently released an episode about 
fighting games on our Patreon. So if you are a fighting game super fan, which if you are listening to this episode, I hope you are, definitely consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to All In and checking out all the Nintendo goodness we have going on over there. We try to keep the community as positive, as non-toxic as possible. We have a ton of amazing people. As a matter of fact, the Retro Logic community and the All In community, there is a lot of overlapping there with uh, all, you know, Dan. As a matter of fact, I think all three of my co-hosts right now are patrons of All In. So uh, I actually yes. get to thank you in person, yep. gentlemen. Thank you so much. I am obligatorily in the, the golden banana tier. The golden because banana can't. tier, yeah. <laughs> I know that all the cool kids are doing it, you know. That's what's so you up. Guys- you missed up by not naming the highest tier the gold banana tier because he would have he would have done it anyway. I would have done it anyway. <laughs> One million dollars a month, golden banana. Well, it's starting money. With, well, we might need to do a new uh, Uncle Randy tier or something later on. Yes. Give <laughs> <laughs> the crop, baby. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out All In. Thank you guys so much for letting me plug the show. Seth and I put a ton of work into it each and every week. We are very proud of the results. Definitely let us know uh, what you guys think of it if you check it out. Excellent. Very poetic. Now, what have you been playing? Now, what have I been playing? Well, well and, and I will mention too, just for the listeners, that is A L L. In capital A L L N podcast. I know yeah, spelling that's fair. it can be any so that's <laughs> that's Alpha Lima Lima November a yeah. Nintendo podcast. <laughs> all capital N, like all Nintendo mm-hmm. mixed with you know like all in playing cards because our mascots and all of our imagery is based off the hand of Fuda cards. So it's a great A it's a great A pun, hard yeah. to say. Yeah, we're clever. We can't help it. <laughs> but Yes, all in or at all in podcast on Facebook, on Twitter, at all the places. So definitely check it out. Thank you for clarifying that, Sam. But what have I been playing? Well, there was a certain JRPG that came out a couple weeks ago that we are gearing up for a full review on. So I've been putting a couple hours here and there into it in the past two weeks. Uh, I've only managed to put literally 104 hours into this game somehow i don't i didn't even think there were that many hours in the preceding two weeks but i've somehow been able to put 104 hours into xenoblade chronicles over the past fortnight um i shouldn't say that because that most people probably think that i played the new goku expansion in fortnite now but we used it we used fortnite two weeks ago we did yeah yeah we we only used one kind of fortnite 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 ago ago? yeah exactly (laughs) that's why we used it (laughs) But uh, I, I have uh, I have played a couple other things. Evo was uh, very, very recently, and I always get a super big itch to play more fighting games after Evo weekend. So I did wind up picking up um, uh, Guilty Gear Double X Accent Core Plus R on the Nintendo Switch. That's, I think, the newest Guilty Gear we actually have on the Nintendo Switch. We don't have XR or Strive or anything like that, unfortunately. But if you're a Guilty Gear fan, it's definitely worth checking out. It's only 15 bucks. I've been playing a little bit of that, especially since they announced Bridget at Evo. I also picked up a fighting game from Bandai Namco that I haven't played in a while. I bought Pokémon Tournament DX again on the Nintendo Switch. we got a couple community members that we've been trying to get a little you know, fighting game night down for a little while. Hopefully we can do that soon. But yeah, after Evo every year, I really get a big hankering to play a lot of fighting games. Skullgirls and even Pocket Rumble on the Nintendo Switch, a super niche type fighter. Oh, you know Pocket Rumble? Oh, yeah. Play Pocket Rumble. Nice. So yeah, Xenoblade 3 and just all the fighting games. What about you guys? Um, Who wants to go next? Well, I so that sounds like you're volunteering, John. So it sounds good to me. Yeah, why not? Um, I've been trying to complete a Xeno series of games, like all of them. So the only two that I had left were Xeno Saga episodes two and three. So this last week, I went ahead and bought two because I found a decent deal on it. They're they're only getting more expensive as we go on. Um, so yeah, yeah those are pretty on. rare, aren't they? Yeah, 
Yeah, two, two, one and two are not as rare. Three, but especially is three. Yeah, three was at the very end of the PS2 life cycle, and it just like nobody bought it. <laughs> Everybody was ready for yeah, those late system releases. Almost yep. always are. So yeah, I'm still, still a little leery of forking over like near three hundred dollars for one PS2 game that could potentially rot on my shelf. So, bro, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Yeah, it's rough. Um, I can't even find like, you know, everyone close their ears. I can't find a good ROM even out there to play this game. So the the only way I can really see is like I'm going to have to pony up eventually if I want to complete my, you know, even just to play it because I didn't play it when it originally released. I was one of the people that passed. <laughs> is it available digitally somewhere? Um, not that I know of. It's a good thing preservation is not an issue in this industry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, everything's everything's easily accessible, and there's no problem with that at all. <laughs> I mean, you would think with, especially in the last, you know, so many, like, even just the life of the Switch, like how popular Xenoblade has become, and like, you think they would want to go back and kind of capitalize on some of the older stuff. Uh, but yes and no. I Still guess waiting for tied. Gotcha Force. With it being a PlayStation game, that might be what ties it up with Ugh. the focus being on Nintendo now. But yeah, I guess if they did a full remake, it would probably come to Switch. And it might just come everywhere. Who knows? Yeah, I'm trying to think of who actually published those games. Like, I know they're PlayStation exclusive, but I don't think they were like published by Sony. So there's there's still hope out there. Surely there's no exclusivity uh, stuff that goes past like you know ten years, fifteen years. Wasn't Atlas? Was it? Uh, I don't. Pub- worldwide publisher was Namco. Yeah, I was thinking. I was looking at episode two. Well, that oh, makes sense. Uh, in Europe, it was published directly by Sony, but okay. everywhere else by Namco. So there you go. Namco could easily get back with Monolith off and be like, "Let's do this." Fingers crossed, guys. Otherwise, I'm going to be out some cheddar for sure to get a hold of that one. But that's not the only game that I bought. I also John, bought... you could sell any one of your sealed like uh, oh, limited run games and buy it tomorrow. So Good. I don't feel bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Castlevania Collection. No, yeah, easy, easy sell. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, no, speaking of limited run, I just got my copy of Axiom, Axiom Verge 2 that I purchased who knows nice. how long ago. Um, nice. I also purchased the, I didn't mention it on my list here, but I purchased the uh, uh, Prima Player's Guide that has 1 and 2 in it to go along with it as well. I, I Very like guides. Cool. I, I don't use them as much anymore, but I just like collecting them. I don't oh, know yeah. what it is. Well, if we think you can buy a Prima video game strategy guide in 2022 alone, it has to be the last one printed. You know, I'm think that's I haven't seen one in forever. I mean, it's been yeah. years. Yeah, uh, really I mean, guide. as far as usability, like I think web resources are are ultimately oh, yeah. more helpful just yeah. because of like search functions and all that. Yeah, well, and, I don't know. Patch, I'll tell you what. I'll patches. tell you what. Kill I'll disagree. I'll disagree with you on that because looking something up online is a little frustrating, as opposed to opening up a physical book and like reading through it. It and can. It's, we are, and yeah. I don't understand. I can't put words to it, but like, there's like YouTube walkthroughs and there's written walkthroughs, and neither I one of them yeah. really. And now like that you me. bring it up, like yeah, like there can be. If you buy a guide, you know that the information is well curated. There's not yeah. going to be a lot of extraneous. It's, it's usually like, in it, order. It sucks when you're looking for an answer yeah. to a simple question and you pull up 13 different 40 yep. minute YouTube video walkthroughs. Yep. I just see that one minute like text guide that has it. I'll tell you what changed yeah. my mind was playing Super Metroid for the first time with a with a paper guide. Mm-hmm. Um, it was amazing. Great experience. Yeah. And obviously. I'm sorry, Sam. Oh, obviously guides often have like a lot of, you know, artwork and stuff yeah. that, you know, it's, it's yeah, it that's is what I mean a collector's for. item in its own right, as yeah. well as, um, 
So yeah, like, was, like the Earthbound Player's Guide was outstanding for a lot of reasons mm-hmm. yeah, beyond just being sure. almost necessary to play the game, yeah. which is why it was included with it. That was actually going to be one of the points I was going to make is the fact that, I mean, for guides, it might be a little bit easier to go through a guide if you have it, if you're able to spend the money on it. But that became the thing is it became much cheaper. It may not be as intuitive, but it became much cheaper to look things up on YouTube, to look things up online. That's why, to your point, Sam, a lot of the guide makers kind of had to go the premium collector's item route they Mm -hmm. had to turn these guides into collectibles themselves that's where all these you know foofy foofy covers came from that's where all the uh, art books and maps and you know everything and and i've got a lot of them i've got like the like the 40 dollar mario galaxy guide like the 40 dollar soul caliber 6 guide and i've got a few of those like super thick especially for like uh, RPG stuff like Fallout. I think it's like War and Peace. Oh, Even yeah. like Pokemon these days. Yeah. Just to list every Pokemon with all of its moves learned at which level is like hundreds I, I, of pages now. I have mm-hmm. a, the Pokemon Platinum Guide, and I'm pretty sure it's larger than a Bible. Like, it's yeah, it's it would not surprise me. That's yeah. my Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Read I mean, it every night. Thick. Exactly. Like, In Arceus, we trust. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever happened to catch him very good yes my extension oh, love it <laughs> yeah no, guys are just kind of my thing like ever since i was a kid i've i've used them i've held on to them most of my guides are from my childhood you know just there's just something about it so i just continued to buy them when they were available for certain games that i liked mm-hmm. uh, so axiom verge was a no-brainer pick up the physical guide when it became available uh, you kind of need it for Axiom Verge too. Yeah, I've heard it's it's not near as uh, easy to navigate as the first one. It's not. It's still so, it's still good, but yeah, it's not nearly as intuitive when it comes to the map yeah. and when it comes to funneling players where they need to go. So yeah, a guide is definitely needed for Axiom Verge too, in my opinion. Yeah, speaking of guides, I also bought the guide to Final Fantasy twelve. Um, the nice. updated version and it's the collector's edition which usually runs about 80 bucks right now for some reason i don't know why mm. like all if you buy the regular standard edition of the game it's a lot cheaper but you don't get all the additional content that came along whenever they remastered it so i wanted to get the good guide and i just so happened <laughs> to run into one at a store and the guy had a hundred bucks on it it, but I couldn't see the price. I had him pull it out and he's like, Oh yeah. And he looks at it. He's like, man, that can't be right. So he looks it up and he's like, uh, comes back and he's like, I think we could do 50 on it. It's like how, hey, like, there you go. well, it gets even better. I start looking around the store a little bit, kind of act like I'm going to pass on it. And he's like, uh, so I get all the rest of the stuff that I bought up there. And, uh, He's like, do you want the guide? I was like, ah, 50 is still like more than I want to spend on the guide, you know, right now. He's like, well, what would you spend? And I was like, 30 bucks. And he's like, sure, <laughs> let's do it. Dang. <laughs> nice. So, so I got Bro. this $80 guide for 30 bucks. Nice. And it's, uh, it's in pretty good shape, too. It has all the inserts, the maps, and everything, too. So I was pretty happy about it. Well nice. done. I didn't even, Very I didn't well even look at it to know it was condition or anything. I just seen it and I was like, man, 30 bucks. I'm just going to use it to play through the game. So, <laughs> uh, so it's complete in bind, I guess. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Everything is there. <laughs> it's nice. Um, the, the other two things that I took up to the counter that I was going to buy no matter what was another guide for Bushido blade on the PlayStation one. And, it's the like complete fighters guide. Like it's actually pretty neat. Like it's, it's got a lot of artwork in it too. Something I haven't seen uh, in a long time, probably not since it originally hit shelves like back in the nineties. Um, but I never bought it. I, I, uh, I didn't have a PlayStation, but I would like flip through the PlayStation book section sometimes at like Walmart or whatever. Um, so I had that and then I had a, <laughs> I had a random copy of lemmings for the PSP in my hand also that they had like, three dollars on and i was like i gotta have this as listen as a lemming super fan i need to know what that plays like i will have to <laughs> fire I it up it in, i want to see it in action yeah 
but I, I'll have to, I don't know when I'll get to it. Cause I, getting to the next thing, I have a problem and I've started Xenoblade three as well. And I haven't stopped either. I haven't played anything else. <laughs> yeah, uh, It's just been all consuming. Like this is like the game I've been waiting for, for most of the year. Like as soon as we found out it was coming when it was, I was like ready for it. So everything else got put away. I probably won't come out of my Xenoblade closet for very long time. I, I, I man, I, there's so much I want to say about the game, but it, yeah, I assume you're liking it so far. Oh yeah, it's it's fantastic. In, in fact, I know you guys will do a you know f- your full review, but you yeah. know as you guys usually do, you, you hold back pretty good on you know most story beats and and things like that that you can. Uh, I, I have a feeling that when I'm done with this one, I'll probably do another episode of On Topic Modern, like I did with uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't hold back, so we'll, it'll be a full spoiler cast. So fair enough. When the time comes, with a you know, I'm sure you'll have 500 hours in it by then, but probably have to have you on for that too. <laughs> hey, I'm down, man. Hey, did did you know Cinna is the girl with the gall? Yes, I did. You did? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure you caught that. Only about every... <laughs> <laughs> Those, you know, blade jokes I don't oh, get. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> well, all you got to do is play it, Dan. Yeah, you played the first five minutes of any Xenoblade game. You know exactly what we're talking about. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I, did, oh, I, get, I played I played a, a lot of at Chronicles X, so I, I think I, I think I have a, a clue as to what you guys are. What have you been playing, Dan? Yeah. Well, let me elaborate on what I've been playing. Not Xenoblade Chronicles X recently. Um, so uh, pickups this last week and the week before have been Clay Fighter, which is I guess topical for the episode. Perfect. And Gradius Three. Both um, from the same seller, weirdly, which I'm like, oh hey, two games that I need for my SNES collection. Trying to kind of trying to kind of put a nice bow on like, here are the Super Nintendo games that are must-haves for me um, before things get even more ridiculous in the market. And I'm really trying to track down a copy of Super Mario RPG, which nice. is one of the most important games in my life. And like, I have the Super Nintendo Mini. And that's how yeah. I've played it recently, and that's a great version. But I also would love to have the cartridge just to sort of, you know, finish that out. Um, and I've yeah. got a short list of other games that I'd like to have, but that one's very high on the list because it seems to, it seems to elude most digital storefronts. Yeah, how much did we get on the NSO app? Oh, I know. <sighs> Square hasn't it. put anything there. Ridiculous. Square is doing remakes, but I don't I don't know what it takes to make that happen. Yeah. That's gonna be some, some weird, deal has yeah. to be brokered. <laughs> yeah. And Something and somebody's cool. gotta really just want it to happen for the good of the fans. I think it's, we're gonna have to sacrifice, you know, one of the interns at Nintendo or something to I'll, I'll do that. i I'd, I'd do it. it. Seems worth it. <laughs> but yeah, it's God, that was such a special game. I absolutely adore it. So, like, that's <laughs> anybody who sees the key art that we use for All In, I'm mm-hmm. Gino. Yep. In the key art. So, yep. that gives you any indication. But, you know, when it comes to Clay Fighter, I just, I got a question for you, Dan, real quick. Have you actually yes. ever seen a sculptor's cut in real life? Yes. I go, to Classic, really? I, I go to Classic Game Fest every year, and usually someone's just got one sitting around for 500 to $1,000. Yep. Um, and nobody ever buys it. Of um, course. Because it's not a game you buy to play. <laughs> it's the same <laughs> one. <laughs> it's the same copy. Yep. And like, uh, the, I don't know. And at that price, you know, if you do buy it, you're probably going to be stuck with it a while. Yeah, exactly. So if unless you're getting a 100% full North American N64 collection, or unless you're just the biggest Clay Fighter fan in the world, I see no reason to own Sculptor's Cut. It, it's not different enough from just the regular 63 to 30. Well, it, it kind of burns knowing that some video store sold that thing for like 50 cents to somebody at some point oh, in time when they were done with it. 
somebody made like way more money off that thing than they ever thought they would. And congrats to them. I certainly have no interest in it. I have more interest in Bomberman Second Attack or whatever the super expensive Bomberman oh, game yeah. is. I'm, I'm way more interested in that. Of the two very rare Super N64 games. <laughs> well, um, I mean, all you got to do is get it graded by WADA. That legitimizes it, right? That's legitimate. Oh, That's legit. Exactly. Yeah. Of, of course. course. Yeah. And if they don't grade it high, you just send it back until exactly, they just yeah. keep sending it in. Exactly. Um, so Clay Fighter is just a super special game to me. Uh, just used to rent it all the time. And then in three to th- 63 and a third, they threw Earthworm Jim in. Yep. So it's just i love i love those games they're not fun <laughs> but they're incredibly wacky they're fun because they're stupid not because they're well made but sometimes you just got to have fun are you a bad mr frosty guy or um i forget their names there's the slime one which i really like taffy's always good taffy um, yeah um, taffy's hacks isn't there santa you can be santa claus i think that's in, in 63, 63 yeah yes yeah, 63, 63 yeah. sumo santa He's a secret character. You got to put in the code for him. Yeah. Booger man. Yeah. And- <laughs> Booger man. Yep. Yes. So, so good, man. Gosh. <laughs> now I got to find a copy of 63 and a third. Anyway, <laughs> um, this, so I, just like yesterday, I had a mail day of another game, which is very much in the vein of um, Mario RPG for me, which is just a game that's super special to me. And I already own it digitally, but I'm like, I got to get this in the collection before things start to explode again. And that is um, Spirit Tracks for the DS. Nice. Um, Yeah, I saw you post that on Twitter. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just really trying to like be more focused about my collection and less like sporadic and like, oh, here's a good deal. Let's buy that thing. I'm never going to play. And yeah, Spirit Tracks. I went into Spirit Tracks as a very disappointed Zelda fan. My opinion of of uh, of um, Phantom Hourglass is very low, um, for very specific reasons. But Spirit Tracks, I actually really enjoyed. I love the touchscreen combat with the with the tapping to attack. I think that's brilliant. I love drawing your path for the boomerang. I love all that stuff. Um, I think the overworld in Spirit Tracks is very interesting, if not flawed, but it's still one of my favorite portable Zelda games. So really excited to own it. Definitely will be playing it soon. Nice. As far as what I've actually been... Huh? So what about Breath of the Wild? Is that that your favorite portable Zelda game? My favorite portable Zelda game, you know what it is. It is uh, Link's Awakening. And I don't consider Breath of the Wild a portable Zelda game, despite the fact that it is available to play portably. (laughs) Um, I don't want to get into that. Shut up. Shut up, John. (laughs) What I've been playing this week, uh, I'm continuing my journey through Pokemon Fire Red um, with my team, which is currently made up of uh, Vileplume, Raichu, Hypno, Blastoise, Arcanine, Articuno. Just caught Articuno. Nice. Um, And... I don't know. Not much to say about that. Having a blast. Love Pokemon Fire Red. Um, trying to finish it before Scarlet and Violet. That's probably going to happen. It's I'm I'm 25 hours in, probably 40 hours to finish it. Um, and then this last week I beat both Portal and Portal Two. Um, nice. Portal Two I think is a perfect video game. Uh, if you ask me, like, what are the best well made, like, not, it's not like, it's such a weird place to be because it's not like the best video game of all time, right? Because it's very limited in its scope. But it, for what it does, it's to me, it's up there with like Star Fox 64, where it's like, this game set out to do XYZ and it executed on XYZ so well that you have to give it credit for that like like star fox 64 is my favorite in 64 game because it had no camera issues had amazing graphics and it told a, a good enough story and like it did its thing and portal 2 and the same thing like you it told an amazing story and it threw puzzles at you and it did all the portal things you love even better than the first one and you come out of it 
like with your mind blown. And it's just such a great game. So I highly recommend everybody getting the Portal Collection, playing through one and two, and having your mind blown. If you haven't, if it hasn't been spoiled for you, hopefully it hasn't. I need that physically. I really want to get that yes. physically. Is it physical or not? I not haven't yet. seen one yet, but I okay. I've, I need that in my life. I I double dip for a reasonable price, for sure. I, I've been kind of waiting for that. I, that's why I haven't bought it because I have so many other things to play. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean it's certainly it's I mean it's there. So it's not like go rush and play it right now. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah, when you have a break, like that's a. 10 to 20 hour experience that I highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Um, I know people it. don't trust digital games, but I have it on steam. And if there's one game, that's probably never going to leave steam. It's, yeah. it's portal and portal. Well, two. Well, I mean, it's exactly. Valve. team yeah, fortress. Exactly. Like that means steam has, <laughs> has ceased to exist, which we have <laughs> yeah. bigger problems for preservation <laughs> at that point. Yeah. If steam ceases to exist, it probably means the internet is gone. So, yeah, it becomes a black hole like the Steam yeah. store does. Sucks everything in with it. Like, you know, we lost power, we lost water, but we still have Steam, so we're okay. <laughs> yep. All right, that's all for me. All right, well, as for me, uh, I actually don't really have any new pickups this week other than I pre-ordered Kirby's Dream Buffet, yes. which nice. will be coming out very soon. Oh, I got to pre-order that. Is that having a physical edition? Not announced as of yet. Of one. No. They'll they set it up could. for pre-orders, and it'll completely crash into yeah, those websites. Once they I'm already sure. got you to pay for it once, yeah, that's when they'll announce it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, as of that, kind of just uh, I don't know, saving money for a change. Um, but I did beat some of the games that I'd been playing, uh, specifically Live Alive. I just beat the other day uh, nice. with the best ending. I actually do want to go back and get the bad guy ending. Um, I've heard that's really fun. Um, But yeah, really enjoyed it. Really glad that this got uh, a a international re-release of such a big scale too. They really kind of went all out on this and seems like a lot of people have loved it. So I loved it too. I mean, I, I pretty much knew I would. Like, I was actually thinking about getting this game and playing it with a fan translation patch before they announced the remake. Um, it was on the list, man. Definitely not every chapter hit the same way, but I think that's the game does have a strong suit where most of the chapters don't overstay their welcome. So if if something's not your thing, like you, you can kind of just keep playing. And, yeah. and you'll find something else. Yeah, the chapters I, I, I see a lot of varying so, opinions. Yeah, on which chap- ones are are good. Yeah, the chapters in Live Alive are so different that more than likely one or two of them are really going to land with you. But yeah, it's ultimately it's a really really yeah, cool. A lot of people don't like Edo, and that was my favorite one. I loved Edo. I that I think that was my favorite one too. Genuinely, one of the best dungeons that I think I've ever played in an well, RPG. And like, like I understand, like if you get lost, it's frustrating. But um, it, to me, that was more like my least favorite chapter, and I, I still think it's I still think it's one of the stronger ones story wise. But my least favorite chapter to play was Near Future, or not Near Future, the um, Distant far, Future, Far Future, um, yeah. Because there, there's basically like no player agency there. No. Um, you're just moving place to place and watching things happen. Yeah, it's incredibly um, gameplay light. Yeah, and not just combat light, but just gameplay light. Like there aren't even puzzles to solve or anything. Yeah. Um. So I mean, as far but, as getting lost, you know this is a Super Nintendo game we're talking about. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the, well, the original didn't have the compass. This oh, one has a compass. God. It's just the compass doesn't really help you in Edo. It it does a lot. Like in the in the future chapter, it's literally just move to the orange marker over and over. Um, but in Edo, that orange marker is a fixed location, and you have to figure out how to get there. And there are locked gates in the way. I will um, not talk about Chrono Trigger. I will not talk about Chrono Trigger. I will not. Talk about- <laughs> Yeah, definitely a game that came out just before Chrono Trigger and had a lot of influence on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Live Alive, loved that. Um, as I mentioned last episode, got sucked back into Battle Network, just kind of out of nowhere. 
And uh, yeah, I, I finished Battle Network 5 Double Team, um, the main game, and I'm kind of just going on right on to the post game. Uh, this is Double Team, and I do actually have the ability to take advantage of some of the extra features that unlock when you have a fully complete game, like a 100% game. Uh, of Battle Network 5 for the Game Boy Advance in the GBA slot. So that's part of why I really want to do the post game because I haven't done this before with all of it unlocked. You can actually unlock an even harder version of base to fight at the very end after you've done everything. Um, so I'm not really done until I defeat base XX. Um, did, did so we'll see how that goes. Communicate with Boktai. They did there and in double team actually does even have a couple things that will, I think it's just extra uh, chip traders that will yeah. appear if you put any of the three Boktai games in the nice. GBA slots. But yeah, most of the games have um, a Gundel soul chip series and a solar boy Django chip series. And this one even has a program advance using both of those together where, It'll, it'll do a special move if you select all those chips together. You guys still have all your copies of uh, Boktai, right? I do not. I never had Including a copy of Boktai, I, and listen, I probably listen. won't anytime soon. I saw one at Classic Game Fest that I was I was this close to buying, but it was not in great condition, and they wanted 100 bucks, and I was like, <sighs> I got to walk away. I just walk away. The UV sensor still works. The in sun it. was almost in your hand, uh, Dan. That's I know, right. man. It's so close, but $100 is too much for the sun. <laughs> it's actually like, I don't think that's a bad deal for it, though. Like, I think they were cutting you, a deal. It was not a clean copy. It was terrible oh. looking. If it was a clean copy, I probably would have picked it up. Honestly. But, but. I think the third game was Jap- Japan only, if I remember right. Yeah, it, it was. sure was. Enough Boktai. We can move well, on. Never, never <laughs> enough yeah. Boktai. So another game I beat and I and I beat on stream on Twitch on the RetroLogic Twitch channel was the first Starfy game for Game Boy Advance, which of nice. course was all in Japanese. But I just kind of there isn't even a, a transla- translation patch for this one. Uh, there's one somebody started. It was never finished. Um, but it's a pretty easy game to fumble your way through. Um, it doesn't take too long. It took two streams. It was like four hours of gameplay about. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I have several other Starfy games. I have the other two Game Boy Advance games and the one that came out everywhere on the DS, which I think is the fifth game, fifth mm-hmm. and final game in the series. Yeah. Um, there's one DS game before it, which I don't have. Um, so that, that, that was fun. Definitely that, recommend Starfy. He reminds me of Kirby a lot. Yeah, it's uh, underwater not the Kirby. First person to notice that. Yeah, like not exactly gameplay wise, but I think just aesthetically, like he, he he just everything looks like it came from a Kirby game. Everything kind of has the same vibe as a Kirby game. You yeah. know, that's um, a collection I want. Is for Nintendo to just release like the legendary Starfy collection with uh, with translations for everything. That would be a day one for me. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't have to do much. I don't. I mean, no. it would it would have to be. I know things get tricky and evidently, you know, this fan <laughs> translation project ran into some issues. Um, things can get a little weird if you're straight emulating a game and you try mm-hmm. to replace text with characters that aren't in the game like you can't just you can't just insert ascii values that's not how these older games work um so because I, I was trying to look up the status of this project and, and apparently they the game started developing a bunch of like serious bugs after they tried to um replace the text it's not a matter of just translating it to english it's you know actually making the text change is something you can't exactly just do with a ROM file. Now, obviously, if Nintendo wanted to, they could just remake the games. Um, and then it would be easy as long as they decided from the start they want to release them everywhere. Um, and I think there'd be an audience for it, even just to bring the series back. You know, I mean, it's it's been a while since the DS. 
Um, I, I think it could have pretty widespread appeal. So I don't know. We'll we'll see what's next for Starfy. He he joins the back burner of Nintendo's franchises that don't get uh, these you know releases every other year like the big hitters like Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, or even stuff like uh, you know Pikmin that haven't exactly been forgotten, even if they don't get you know the regular rotation. Um, but we'll see uh, and. I'm also still streaming Mother 3 and coming up on the end of that. Uh, so left off arriving in New Pork City um, to pull the final <laughs> needle. So either the next stream or the one after that will be the last for Mother 3 Monday. And then it will give way to something else, I suppose, which might have to be a Mega Man Monday. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't be bad about it. See. Uh, the one other thing that I fired up recently, a game I picked up just a month ago, uh, Power Quest for the Game Boy Color, and this is on our fighting game topic because it is kind of a fighting game. Um, little little Sunsoft thing. I kind of found out about this when I was researching Sunsoft, um, and it's it's just this relatively simple Game Boy Color game. The premise is very custom robo. It's basically about these toy robots that kids like to battle and there's a tournament. Um, and so you have kind of like this RPG sort of simple RPG setup where you're moving around town, challenging people to battles. And when you win battles, you earn money, which you can use to buy parts to upgrade your robot. But the actual battles basically play like a 2d fighting game. Um, and when you buy new parts, you basically unlock new special moves. And that's pretty nice. much all there is to it. But it's actually pretty fun. So, yeah, check out Power Quest if you are just looking for Game Boy Color games that you might have not known about before. Looking it up right now. That is a good recommendation. Thank you. 30 to 50 bucks. Doesn't look bad. Cool. Yeah, I, th- I think I got it for like 20 something, but you do some digging. Yeah, I, I, I do a lot of just like low bidding people on Mercari when I don't really care <laughs> if I if they accept it or not. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. find, I find if you bid 20 percent under, you'll you'll get accepted um, like half the time. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's that is it for what we have been playing. So let's move on to some prices retro. Yes. If this is your first time playing The Price is Retro, this is how we play. I'm going to list off four to five games, and everyone else has to guess how much these games are worth in total. Whoever's guess is the closest wins that round, and the next person lists off their games. Everyone brings a list, and everyone guesses on everyone else's list. At the end of the game, whoever wins the most rounds wins the game. But look out for the poltergeist. He guesses $300 on every list, and if he wins the game, Dan will give away a Poltergeist sticker from the merch store to a lucky winner. I'll uh, do that. From our community. I will do it. So hopefully you're rooting for us and not for the Poltergeist, but I do understand if you want one of those stickers. They're pretty cool. Yeah, you know, kind of make things interesting a little bit sometimes. You just gotta, you know, throw them a bone or whatever. Little ghost joke in there. The vacuum, you know. The vacuum. That's right. Throw him a, a spectral bone. Whatever ghosts uh, have. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, uh, a ghost bone because does Eric, does Eric have a list? Bones That's my have question. ghosts. <laughs> I have a list. All right. Well, I do since indeed. you have a list, would you like to start us off? I would love actually love to start us off with the prices retro this episode obviously we came on to talk about some fighting games this evening so go figure i think you might see a bit of a pattern with my list so my first game it's nintendo dog clones isn't it 
God, why you got to ruin things, Dan? I knew, why you gotta... I knew it. I just know oh, you, man. dude. <laughs> Spending too much time in Pokemon Red, he's becoming a psychic type himself. <laughs> Ooh, like Hypno. Yeah, exactly. So, my first game is loose copy of Soul Calibur on the Sega Dreamcast. Hmm. My second. Loose. Yep. Loose okay. copy, Soul Calibur, Sega Dreamcast. Next, we have Primal Rage yes. on the Super Nintendo Complete Inbox. Ooh. I got you. Next, and this is one that Seth actually picked out. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 on the Xbox Complete Inbox. Trixie. Complete in box. Mm -hmm. And then for the last one, I decided to go really fighting game. King of Fighters 94 for the Neo Geo Advanced Entertainment System. Loose. <sighs> Damn you, Eric. Had to do it to you guys. <laughs> I just, I don't even... I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is um, how so I feel on. every week. So hang on. So John's gonna guess first on this one. We're gonna keep the order. All so right. John John guess first. I think I'm gonna go but wait. Oh man. All right. I'm just going out there. Let's do five fifty. This one's ghosty. Five fifty? Yep. Okay. And then Sam? Well, I'm going low. I've got 265. I'm kind of between you guys here. I'm at 330. Actual Sorry. retail price. 381.37. Dan's on the money. Very Dude, nice. This is why I came on the show. This is why. Because I can't <laughs> I can't give up the title. <laughs> Soul <laughs> Caliber loose. For the Sega Dreamcast is twenty dollars even. Primal Rage for the Super Nintendo Complete in Box currently listed at fifty four dollars fifty four cents. Marvel vs. Capcom on the original Xbox Complete in Box one hundred dollars and sixty nine cents. Nice, oh, so close on that one. And nice. King of Fighters ninety four for the Neo Geo AES loose is two hundred and six dollars oh. and fourteen cents. Man. So total of three hundred and eighty-one fourteen. Well done, Senor Caparello. That was. I, I was tracking until that last game. I'm more surprised at the Xbox Marvel vs. Capcom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, MVC two. MVC two is nuts. Yeah. All right. Um, who wants to go next? I'll, I'll go, I'll next. go. John, who goes next? Yeah. John, John, go next. I, I figured. Since Eric brought the good fighting games, I would bring some horrible fighting games that you guys might not even know of. I respect oh, that. So, oh, uh, I don't. I don't respect it. I, I'm sure you know this first one. Everyone knows the first one. So the first one is Shaq Fu, uh, but the Game Boy version, complete in box. <sighs> oh, those complete in box Game Boy games, man. <laughs> Jeez. The uh, the second game is Tom and Jerry War of the Whiskers for the GameCube, complete in box. Okay. The third game is Balls 3D for the Super Nintendo, complete in box. <laughs> oh, Balls 3D, oh god. <laughs> yeah, that that game. Uh, I bet it's worth less complete in box because of how bad it is. Uh, probably. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I should have added it. I just thought of a horrible game that should have went on this list, too, but uh, it didn't Do make it. Do a bonus it. round. Uh, yeah. Um, we'll save that for if there's a tiebreaker. Okay. I can look it up <laughs> really fast. Um, the last game is Fighters Mega Mix for the Saturn. Fighters, box. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sega, this is oh, Sega is Saturn? It, this yes. is the game where you can play as the car, right? This yeah. is the game where you can play right. as the car. Yeah. Yeah. Arguably the most nuts roster in the history of fighting games, which oh, yeah. is saying something. That's pretty pretty, pretty much it. That's that's the one. 
fight as a car. Okay, Sega Saturn game. All right. I think we've done that one before. Has that been on Prices Retro before? I think we Possibly. Have at this point. I think yeah, I think so. It probably has at this point. It was inevitable. Yeah. Okay. Um, so who is guessing first? Who's guessing first is Eric is guessing first. Uh, well, the last time I was on this, I did absolutely terribly. I don't see any reason to really change that. So I, I got to go with my gut, though. Honestly, I'm feeling 180. Okay. And then Sam? Well, I was low last time. So in my effort to always be wrong, I'm going to guess high. Uh, I've got just an even 400. Wow, that is high because I have 225. Mm. Yeah, Eric and I are flirting. Mm. Flirting with danger. Ooh. Go ahead, like John. <laughs> hey, hold on a second. Uh, no. I was just trying to make sure that I got everything marked down in the right place. Oh, you're running the spreadsheet tonight. I know. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think <laughs> I, everybody thank John profusely for running the spreadsheet because that is a job I could never do. This is a job I've had to do and yes. it doesn't always go well. No, it only goes well when John does it. Okay. Well, Dan, you said 225? Yes. All right. And then Sam, what was yours one more time? 400. All right. And then Eric, you one more time. Uh, whatever the right answer is, that's my guess. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> 180. 180. Okay. Yeah, I, I had some things flip flop for some reason. But all right, we're good to go. So my total for this lot is $279.22. Nice. Good job, Dan. Well, actually, the ghost takes that one, right? Yep. What? Wait, yeah, what was the yeah. Yeah. you you were getting you guessed two twenty five? Yeah, what's the ghost? What what was the actual score? So the ghost was only twenty dollars and seventy eight cents off, uh, and you were uh, off by 54, about fifty. Yep, fifty four dollars <sighs> twenty two cents. All right, Poltergeist took one. He did. I thought I told you guys to stop doing numbers so close to three hundred. <laughs> this is how it works That's out. How it works man. out a lot of times. Four games on average, usually. Yeah. I will bring. Okay, so I did have a win recently. Let's just remember that. That's true. For a second, and I will mention too. I was the original ghost. The first time I ever won, I did so by just guessing three hundred every time. Sam is That's the why ghost. the ghost guesses <laughs> three hundred. This is correct. Really, the ghost has stolen my strategy, and that's why I always lose now. But I want to see the breakdown of this. Like, show your work. How in the world did those games go for that much? <laughs> so Shaq Fu for the Game Boy complete in box is $170. Someone is having a laugh. That's, that's complete fake. in box Game Boy games are just they are they're nuts. Nobody keeps the box for their Game Boy games. Fake news. Uh, it, Tom and Jerry War the Whiskers complete in box for the GameCube is $42.50. Shut Probably up. Also- also not worth that much yeah i wouldn't uh, pay that for all the games you listed uh yeah i, I wouldn't either um balls 3d for the super nintendo complete in box 24 dollars 97 cents it's probably how much it cost brand new when out. it came out <laughs> uh fighters mega mix for the sega saturn complete in box uh 41 dollars 75 cents that Everyone actually sounds probably- low to me yeah, yeah I, I thought, thought that one would be high. I did yeah. not think balls would be high. No. But <laughs> it's not. I it's figured it was all the Sega Saturn Come and probably, probably the Shaq Fu. It's not it's not just balls, it's also three D balls. Yeah. Where every kind of is <laughs> yeah. balls. Let's let's move on. I don't want to talk about balls anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're talking about balls anymore. Manscape's gonna sponsor this. Yeah, it falls <laughs> on you guys. Mm-hmm. Let's move on. Jeez. All right. Well, we've got some fighting game lists. I too have a fighting game list. So I guess go I'll figure. go next. Yes. Uh, not really any 
particular order category to these other than that they are all fighting games. Um, first up, I have Bushido Blade for the nice. PlayStation Complete, yeah, nice. which yep. has already been mentioned once tonight. Um, second, a Famicom game, and it is Joy Mech Fight. Joy Mech Fight, Famicom. yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, Sugabon. Yes. Yep. So Nintendo's first fighting game. Unless, yeah. Is yeah, that their first fighting just game. The, is that only a Japanese karate first? Release? Yeah. So that did not come but out. Kung, Kung Fu is a black box. Might have okay. been first. It might have been. Yeah. Was, well, I mean, Kung Fu is a beat em up, basically. Yeah, it's a bit more of a yeah. beat em up than a than a fighting game. When did Urban yeah. Champion come out? Because I mean, you could also argue Punch Out is a bit yeah. of a fighting game. Well, Punch Out, yeah, I don't absolutely. Know if that was oh, yeah, prior Punch to this either. Game. Yeah. All right, anyway, right Joy Mech Fight for the Famicom <laughs> loose <laughs> once again. Uh, followed by Tech Romancer for the oh, nice. Sega Dreamcast. Yes. Nice. Complete. This one's definitely been on Prices Retro before because I've used it. I think I long. may have used it too. I think everybody's yeah. used it once, but the price changes. That's why this is evergreen. It's very we can true. keep using the same game. We can just speculate on the price of Plock every week if we want. <laughs> um, and lastly, because it's a fighting game list, and because we we go for some of the some of the deep cuts, sometimes you have to have a Neo Geo game on there. I have Waku Waku 7 for the Neo Geo Complete. Gosh, Complete Neo Geo. I don't even, I don't even, I'm so lost with this one. 450. (laughs) All right. Um, Those Neo Geo games are, I was going to say, I'm glad I didn't, I already guessed first once. (laughs) Ridiculous. (laughs) Technically, um, it was Dan's turn to guess first. It was my turn yeah. to guess first, which is fine. I was going to guess 301. 301. Just don't want to let the ghost have it, huh? No, I don't. I have no You're idea. Are confident that it's higher than 300? Semi-confident. Okay. I'd say at least 51%. I'm going to go, let's do 500. 500. All Three, right. Four, so five. I'll, I'll give, give you the breakdown leading up. Uh, Bushido Blade for the PlayStation Complete, $30, 5 cents. Joy Mech Fight for the Famicom Loose, $20, 53 cents. Hmm. Tech Romancer for the Sega Dreamcast Complete, $170, 90 cents. Okay. And Waku Waku 7 for the Neo Geo Complete is $1,399.95. Guess who wins My that one? God. Not the, ghost. the total value to sixteen twenty one and forty three cents. Is that John? That's yeah. me. Easy by like Jesus. Eleven hundred and twenty one dollars <laughs> off. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, I have a point. The ghost has a point, and John has a point. So we just got to make sure that the ghost doesn't. Guess this so if list. You guess two ninety nine, and I guess three hundred one. We'll see exactly. who really wins this thing. I have a feeling though that you're you're gonna be unless I take the point, and then we'll just have a big old tie. Yeah, uh, yeah then or Eric, or a four way tie. Or Eric, you take the point. Yeah. I'm not taking this. I'm terrible at this game. <laughs> Here we go. Um, all of my games have nothing to do with fighting. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's a heck of a theme. <laughs> I did the I, I did the Dan thing where I picked a word. So all these games have the same word. I love this. First theme. game is I know it's so fun for you guys. Uh, Quantum Theory for PlayStation Three, complete in box. Quantum Break for the Xbox One, complete in, bro- in box. 007 Quantum of Solace for the Wii, complete in box. And Kabuki Quantum Fighter for the NES, complete in box. <sighs> Just so much quantum. It's my turn to go first. It Sorry, what is... was the second one again? We have uh, quantum, quantum Break, break for the Xbox okay. One. 
Yeah. Yep. 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 That was the one with uh, break, one solace. the Iceman actor, wasn't it? Mm. It's such a good question that I I don't know the answer to because I don't know anything about it. Yeah, he just <laughs> picked a word and looked at a list, so he has no information <laughs> on these games. No. Nope. I own Quantum uh, Theory, so I know this one. I'm just going to guess 161. Okay. That's a good guess. And John? Uh, I think I'm going to go $85. Okay. And Eric? $23.46. $23.46. Okay, cool. And the answer is $23 and 40. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the, real, the real answer is $103.85, making Sam nope. the winner. Yes. No, nah, John was closer. Oh, yeah, John. Were John, were you $85? Okay. I John was, 85. I was 85. All right. That also means John takes the uh, episode. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Game set and Good match. Count. Let's get well you done, sir. On those GGs. Games, GGs. Yeah. GGs much, all around. How much were they individually? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Quantum Theory for PS3 is seventeen sixty one. Hmm. Quantum Break for Xbox One is five eighty six. Quantum of Solace for the Wii is four dollars and thirty eight cents. <laughs> And Kabuki Quantum Fighter for the NES Complete is $76. There it is. Lots of quantum video games. Lots with of quantum, quantum cheapness. Stuff. There were a few other ones I could have included, but I decided on these very specifically for you guys. So enjoy. Aww, enjoy that. Thank you. Yep. For your, yeah, you're welcome. You are welcome. Um, in addition to Prices Retro, unless somebody else here has a game to play, the Ambassador has provided a new game that he has concocted. He likes to do that from time to time, and we thank him for it. Um, let me see if I read this right. It's a riddle game. He's. It's called I Don't Give a Capcom. Can you figure out the name of these uncommon games by their clues? Okay, and there's 10 clues in 10 games. So he, he, I guess he wrote a clue, and then we have to guess the game. And we'll do these one at a time. So here's our first clue it is being revealed to me for the first time. It says, the opposite of dad, dad, the offspring. <clears throat> oh, son, son? Yeah. Yeah, son, yes. son. son, son is that a yeah. game? Sun Sun, yeah, the little dad. Journey to the Sun West, Sun. Yep. Uh, old okay. uh, Capcom arcade game. Sun Sun actually yep. appeared in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. And it's actually <laughs> free right now on the uh, arcade collection, too. Yeah, the Capcom second arcade stadium. Yep. Second arcade stadium, yeah. Yeah, the answer is Sun Sun. There it is. All right, clue number two. When you call Starbucks because you accidentally left Neptune at their place, you have a... Blank, blank. It's going to be Neptunia. The um, gosh, what is it? When you call Starbucks because you accidentally left Neptune at their place, you have a lost Neptune. Lost, lost planet. Lost planet. Lost planet. Lost planet. Okay. planet. Got it. That's it. Lost planet. That's the answer. Uh, Where does Starbucks come into that? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why Starbucks, though. It doesn't. You, that's just where you left it. Mm. Oh, is yeah. that a common <laughs> place to leave your planets? That's, I leave my planets there all the time. Mm. Every time I go to Starbucks. I usually the- find them in between the couch cushions, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, clue number three. When... Beezlebub says he can't get through Titanic without a box of tissues. He's warning this. Devil may cry. Devil may cry. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. Clue number four. A burning ball of gas in space plus the guys who fight in the Coliseum. Sun Warrior? Star? Starfighter? Star Gladiator? Star? Is that Star Gladiator a game? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's the answer. Star Gladiator. 
All right. Clue number five. When you wrestle your brother six times and he challenges you to one last time, it is the seventh saga. Seventh. Seventh. Seventh struggle. Is that a game? Seventh fight. Seventh bout. It's a Capcom game. So. Seventh saga. final, Final fight. Oh, oh, is it final yeah. fight? Let's, it's the last I mean, we went to seven. Yeah, final yeah. fight would. Yeah, I'm trying to. More sense. You know, I'm, I'm trying because some of these clues have have things that don't actually matter to the game. So I know, I know, mm-hmm. it's 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 tricky. Yeah, um, the number Ambassador. didn't matter. It was just the fact that it was the last fight. Ambassador <laughs> is tricky, and the answer is final fight. Yep. Okay. Clue number six: When your friend eats all the T Rex shaped chicken nuggets you were saving, and you freak out. It becomes a dino crisis. Sorry, yes. I'm guessing. I'm <laughs> guessing it as I read it. That is that is the answer. Um, clue number six, seven. Your your L A T V E R I A N. What is that? Just like what? La- Latvarian. Latvarian. Okay. Yeah, Latvarian. It's where Doctor Doom is from. Oh, God. I don't know anything. Your Latvian friend is trying to say you have a beautiful cup of coffee, but he has an accent. Uh, it's something with Marvel. Marvel versus Capcom? I don't uh, know. Beautiful Joe. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful Joe? Yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful Joe. Joe. Yeah. Oh, my Joe's God. Got an accent, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. You like that? <laughs> That was actually pretty good. That was pretty good. That got got me. Um, Let me get back here. Okay. Clue number eight. The lead character from Saved by the Bell got married to the website that is filled so much. Zach and Wiki. Yeah, Zach and Wiki. Number eight is Zach and Wiki. I just sold that game to Adam. Super underrated game. God, that game's amazing. Is he the main character of Saved by the Bell, though? Zach. Zach? Yeah. Yeah. He was the he's the one who narrates it. That's, That's true. true. True that. Clue number nine. When you sneak up on Luke Skywalker's Jedi powers and catch them by surprise, you yell. Power Power Stone. No, power force. No. The force. Force sneak. something, right? Force. Sneak up on this surprise. Gotcha um, force. Gotcha, gotcha force. force. Oh my gosh, Dan. Come on. Dan. Dan. Guys, that I had one yours, job. Buddy. I had one job. <laughs> Why couldn't I get it? Well, guys, welcome to Dan's retirement stream. Yes. I'm never doing like that. I'm never this is why I was gonna skip. You guys you guys made me come back on. All right. Clue number ten. Person one, person two, person three, person four, person five, and person six are all dead. It's because of person seven. So it's killer seven. Yeah, killer seven. Yeah. Uh, number ten is killer seven. Wow, we got them we all got, though, didn't we? We got all of them. Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah. 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 He needs to I, change his name to Balls 3D now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. With a Z, of course. Yes, Balls. Excellent. Yeah. So, that's. I think that's all the games. I think, John, if you have the uh, obligatory yeah, trivia let's card. Let's do the cheesy card that everyone gets all the answers right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Question one. The psychological horror game PT was primarily an interactive teaser for which video game that was eventually canceled and never released? Silent Hill. Silent Hills. Yes, Whatever. he's correct. Silent Hill was released, I, I'm pretty listen, sure. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you couldn't hear my eyes physically roll out of the back of my head just then, you need to turn the volume up. They did. I caught them, actually. I caught them. Yeah. Do you, you guys think know... You- who was the creator of that game? Who was working on it? The Guillermo del Toro. In conjunction with? Um, like Hideo Kojima, I mean. Yep. Johnny, yeah. Johnny Depp. Yeah. It was going to be Kojima's spin on Silent Hill. 
David yeah, Bowie. Norman Reedus attached to it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like usual. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That wasn't on the card, by the way. I just seen if you guys That's are good. paying attention. I'm not, uh, but thank you. <laughs> question two which fictional species of creature is ratchet in the video game series ratchet and clank <sighs> lombax yep. he is a lombax yep i had to think like am i sure this is it like <laughs> am i just making up syllables but yeah awesome well nope. <laughs> again no brain busters here but uh definitely can spark up some other conversation i guess my brain's broken. <laughs> yeah, Dan's like, what's a Lombax? Come on. <laughs> Why do I host this show sometimes? You guys should just do it. <laughs> I don't know anything. Well, what I want to know is what do you call a group of Lombaxes? Are they like a herd or a... No, I'm sure they have like... I'm, yeah, I'm murder. sure they have like some kind of weird group name, you know. It's a squirt. A and squirt of Lombaxes. Does. A squeegee of Lombaxes. A house of representatives of Lombaxes. That's that's it. That's what it is. Got there. So how do you know that it would be Lombaxes if it's multiples of them? Lombaxes. 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 Sorry. Lombaxes. Sorry. Yes, Lombaxes. There you go. Lombaxes. Isn't that a, isn't that a bone? Maybe. <laughs> Look, Sam, I'm sorry, but your Lombaxes has been fractured. Yeah. Again? I have, I have lombositis of the lombi. <laughs> of the lumbar region? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that is it. We don't have any other guest lists, correct? Correct. So if like, you, listener, would like to send us a list for Prices Retro or for any other games we play, do that via Discord or email or however you get in touch with us. We would be happy to you can, use you can that DM, list as a bonus D round on the show. DM me on Twitter or Discord. DMs are open. Just send me a message. Um, yep. And with that, uh, I guess we'll take a short break and move on to our show topic and the community couch. <laughs> So we are, of course, welcoming back to the show uh, Eric Provost from the All In Podcast, who is a prodigious fan of fighting games, if you didn't know. Uh, and, of course, Nintendo doesn't always get a whole lot of fighting games on their systems. So here's a good place to talk about them, because we're not just a Nintendo <laughs> podcast. We're a retro podcast. We That's love right. all the platforms. We do. Um we do love Nintendo, but we also like Sony and Sega and even Microsoft and even Atari. And yeah. Those Neo Geo fighting games. Neo Geo, yeah, absolutely. Neo Geo. Wonder Swan, Gamecom, mm -hmm. all those. The Neo Geo Pocket Color was an oddly really good system for fighting games, too. So. I mean, in a lot nice. of ways, I don't know a whole lot nice. about it. I don't know a whole lot about it, but. The Neo Geo, both both the Neo Geo Pocket and and the Neo Geo in general, seem to largely be sustained by fighting games. It seems to be like half the library. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> SNK's calling card. Kind of always has been, you know, franchises. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the biggest franchise is King of Fighters yeah. for, and all the all the series that that wrap into that. Um, but yeah, I, I think I just start by uh, kind of going around just talking a little bit about how we got into fighting games to the extent we did. I know not all of us are as big of fans, but uh, just kind of give a little bit of personal history with that. Um, so I, I don't know if I've had a chance to talk with Dan or John about this much, but John, uh, what are, what are fighting games to you? Um, fighting games to me are not as, they're not as big of my gaming life today as they were back in the 90s like when they were seemed to be everywhere like like there was that boom where like 
and the, the whole arcades were just like full of them all of a sudden like they just like came on they took over yep uh whereas today like you you don't have arcades as much so like you kind of have to be looking for them and it kind of like split the road with gamers like you're either a fighting game gamer or like other games like it seems like there's two different kinds um but back in the 90s i was uh very much into most fighting games uh that were pretty good i mean i played a lot of street fighter uh any of the sequels that you want to to throw out there any of the variations of the sequel uh played lots of mortal kombat i've mentioned on the show several times i've probably rented mortal kombat three enough times i could have bought seven copies of it um it was like a a weekly rental for me nice uh, for quite a long time uh killer instinct was a huge game i played a lot of killer instinct it was pretty much like between it and primal rage were probably like uh two probably lesser fighting games like at at that time but like killer instinct played phenomenally like it was very good well put together i mean can't can't expect less from rare uh but yeah i mean 90s was my fighting game time i kind of fell off later on um other things just kind of took their place over time and like it just seemed as i got older it was harder to find like time with my friends where you know fighting games are meant to be played with other people they're not very fun to play by yourself (laughs) so Mm -hmm. as you kind of get i got older and like you know it's been a lot less time hanging out with my friends like for long periods of time to play games i wasn't spending the night at people's houses or whatever so fighting games just kind of became, they kind of fell off for me and I was playing more single player experiences like JRPGs and, and things of that nature. So, um, well, and that, that very much coincides, I think with the general popularity of fighting games, taking a dip yeah. towards the late nineties into the two thousands. Uh, Dan, how about you? I know, I know you're not necessarily a huge fighting game fan and we talked a little bit about what exactly counts, um, Certainly some people's definitions may not include some of the more, uh, you know, party fighters or things like smash Bros. but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. So I think my experience of fighting games is pretty limited compared to you guys for sure. Um, like I never really got into like mortal Kombat or street fighter to any extent. Uh, I think I honestly don't know why. It just wasn't, I probably just lost and was like, eh. Um, but uh, the things that attracted me to certain fighting games was certainly like novelty. I have really fond memories of playing things like Primal Rage and Clay Fighter um, and even like the Ultraman, like uh, oh, wow. giant monster fighting game. Like, wow. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, So those I remember even more fondly than something more typical like a Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter or even Killer Instinct, which to me was like, oh, more Mortal Kombat. Why would I care about that? Um, And then, of course, uh, the more party-oriented fighting games were were attractive to me because they they are usually much simpler to pick up, um, like easy to easy, simple to learn, hard to master type stuff like Smash Brothers and Brawlhalla. Um, and, uh, so I, I mean, I played a ton of smash brothers still do. Um, and then I had, uh, I had a huge love affair with more like top down 3d, like beat em up style, um, games, which I don't know whether you consider them like fighting games or not, but stuff like cannon spike and power stone, um, and then like arena fighter stuff, like, um, like, uh, uh, custom robo and gotcha force stuff like that. So like probably to the extent that you guys are going to talk about fighting games here, like I'm not, I'm not well versed, but I'm here to learn. <laughs> and obviously this show is more about what I'm into than, you know, just that stuff. So, um, yeah, happy to be here and talk about whatever I know about. But yeah, also here to just mm-hmm. uh, kind of listen and hear you guys talk about what you know about. So, 
All right. Well, Eric, when when did it start for you? What 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 made these this such a such a special genre, such a favorite genre for you? What are fighting games? Sorry. What, okay. Um, <laughs> no, um, well, I mean that that is sort of an open question when you bring UFC. up stuff like Smash Bros. And does that count? Uh, people have opinions. If you weren't aware. Well, I mean uh, the they kind of fall into kind of this greater subgenre of what are known now as platform fighters now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the second word in that being very evocative, I think. But for me, yeah, I was part of that generation that fully experienced Street Fighter Two in the arcades, that fully experienced the original Mortal Kombat in arcades. I have very vivid memories of those Senate hearings that created the ESRB uh, to do in large part to Sub-Zero's proclivity for removing his opponent's spine via their head. Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. I, I just, the, the entire genre just absolutely, like, just grabbed me. Just absolutely grabbed me. I love all, I love all games, but there is something special about the fighting game genre. There is something special about the purity of that one versus one kind of competition. Uh, it's some of the most exciting, some of the hypest moments in the history of video games in general, whether or not you're playing them competitively, whether or not it's in an esports venue or something like that. You know, it's just something about fighting games, something about the allure, something about the secret, something about the competition. Uh, it's it's just it clicked with me almost immediately. I found out that I was fairly good at them as a young kid. I could beat fully grown adults at my local bowling alley in X Men: Children of the Atom or in Ultimate Mortal Kombat Three. Yes. So, uh, and uh, like just the history, the evolution of the genre, I've always felt was so incredibly, incredibly interesting. I have always considered myself somewhat of a kind of amateur video game historian, but especially when it comes to the history of fighting games, I've been following the genre for over three decades now. And just the, the highs, the lows, the stories, you know, we talk about the Senate hearings, but there's been some really, really interesting uh, legal battles within the fighting game genre. Mm. So just everything I've just, from a gameplay perspective, from an IRL perspective, I just find the entire genre so fascinating and always have. Yeah. I, I kind of want to go back because it's very different from my own experience. Um, actually getting into getting into, especially the more in-depth side of fighting games from the arcade context. Uh, that's actually kind of strange for me to think about um, because I there were a number of games I played uh, for a long time, just casually button mashing, whatever. Like I played them, I enjoyed them, didn't think a whole lot of them. Um, weirdly enough, never Street Fighter. Um, at least my Super Nintendo library growing up did not include Street Fighter. Uh, yeah. There were a number of rentals that I played. The main fighting games that we owned were Clay Fighter and uh, Turtles 5 Tournament Fighters. There you go. Um, but we, did, for whatever reason, just didn't own Street Fighter 2. Just somehow missed the boat on that. I probably played it at an arcade once or twice, but, you know, just didn't own it on the Super Nintendo. As much of a staple game as it is. And, you know, through that, you know, even getting into games like Soul Calibur on the GameCube, because, you know, it had Link in it. Of course. Um, And, of course, playing Smash Bros. And Smash Bros. was one game that really kind of drew me into the greater context. Specifically Brawl, actually. Um, obviously I played 64, I played melee. Um, but I remember, um, when my brother went to college, he started, you know, playing with a lot of people in his dorm and they started going to tournaments. And so he would come home and we would play smash. And he was kind of like pushing me into this higher level of play. And I was picking it up pretty quickly uh and and that really is a big part of i think what makes fighting games finally click for people is having that kind of rival you know somebody who is as good as you maybe slightly better but that you know you can beat uh and you even mentioned that like being able to you know as a 13 year old beat grown adults 
And it was kind of like the same thing for me because my brother's six years older than me. So for my young life, we were just, you know, worlds apart. You know, when you're ages six and 12, it's like you don't have a lot in common. But this was really part of when we started to like actually bond as we kind of caught up that age didn't seem as, as big a difference when you're like 13, 19, we're still kind of different worlds, but you know, in the world of games, we're equals, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, even though, you know, he can drive a car and and do all these adult things and I can't, right. Um, he he can have a job and I can't, right. But you found uh, the equalizer. And so that, that was like, that was part of it. But to me too, it was always a, a, this was always, I, I even still didn't really go to a lot of tournaments. I mostly just played with him and it was a lot of just like studying the game at home. And I find that kind of hard to like picture doing with an arc, like, cause the, Anybody who who stumbles through the early stages of of getting a grip on a fighting game knows you're going to take a lot of L's in order to learn. You're going to get your butt kicked L in order to learn what not to do. And it's hard for me to think of doing that when every time you do that costs you another quarter. So I, I I don't know. It was is it because the games were a little bit simpler then, or is it? Is this just how it was? You know, you just uh, had that fire were, to, if, to well, keep you just wanted a way to play it. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of console ports at the time, and, and when they were, they weren't near as good as the arcade. That might have been my problem. Well, there were several things when it came to fighting games in the arcades. Is Street Fighter 2, obviously you had like the super, super early fighting games, stuff like uh, Karate Champ, mm-hmm. stuff like uh, Warrior from from Vector Beam, I think, stuff like, you know, Urban Champion, stuff like ER Kung Fu. But Street Fighter 2 really was the first game to nail down a really satisfying, you know, gameplay system for a fighting game. And especially back in the early 90s, that's when the arcades were king. That's right. when the arcades were king. You couldn't get arcade perfect experiences at home yet. Obviously, with the rise of you know the console market, the NES was giving way to the Super Nintendo. The you know the Genesis was right around the corner. So we still had that console market, but arcades still offered really special experiences. And especially, especially in the early '90s, Street Fighter II tapped into something immediately from a business perspective, purely from a business perspective, because arcade machines from that business standpoint was all about how can we most efficiently get people to shove their quarters into our machines. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when you introduce that deeply competitive, uh, that deeply competitive culture, that deeply competitive atmosphere, exactly what you're talking about. There were higher stakes playing multiplayer in the arcades because you had to pay each time you lost. There were actual mm-hmm. consequences. Yep. It's so, really kind of ingenious because instead of, yeah. you know, just just draining people's quarters by making the game super hard, you've tricked the players into making it harder for each other. Exactly. I mean, and no. I mean, when you talk about uh, the American culture, well, I mean, we're not too competitive, right? Nah, not, 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 not too competitive, but it worked perfectly from a business standpoint because it got people to like whether who won or who lost. Somebody was about to give you more money. But mm. in addition to that, it solved another problem the players were having because a lot of the arcade machines at the time were, for the most part, single player affairs that you could get better at, that you could get more proficient at, but they were experiences that you kind of knew what you were getting. When you were playing Miss Pac-Man or you were playing Galaga or games like that, you knew what was going to happen. You knew the levels, you knew the experience, you knew the patterns and everything like that. So you could get better, which means two things. One, you weren't putting, you weren't putting money in the machines as often. And two, eventually that experience was going to get a little stale for you. So from a gameplay standpoint, Street Fighter 2 gave you a dynamic experience every time. Mm-hmm. You didn't have an AI loop that you could, well, I mean, if you played arcade mode, yeah, but when you had somebody else there, you didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know what they were going to do. They 
It wasn't just some computer that you could memorize the patterns for. It wasn't just some laid out scripted sequence that you could eventually get better at. That offered, uh, Street Fighter 2 offered a much more dynamic arcade experience for everybody while at the same time giving companies a far more lucrative business model when it came to the arcade machines. Yeah. So the one person. Yeah, can get to I mean, I, I guess one of the other things I'm thinking about too, you know, after I kind of got really into Super Smash Bros. Brawl, uh, mm -hmm. I eventually did kind of from that gain an interest in other fighting games. Uh, most specifically, my real touchstone for the Street Fighter series uh, was an old, at this time, already old copy of Street Fighter Alpha 3 for the PlayStation mm -hmm. 1. Uh, yep. So. We never had a PlayStation 1, but we got a PlayStation 2, and we would just buy PS1 games at, at yard sales. And so this was one of them. Didn't think much of it then, but as I started thinking more about fighting games, I went back into that, and I had the benefit at this point of being able to go online. At this point, it was still like GameFAQs. There, there weren't YouTube mm -hmm. tutorials on stuff yet. Yep. But yeah. Like GameFAQs and, and figure out like, okay, how does the combo system work? How do you, you know, actually learn a character? Uh, I was also old enough that I could actually wrap my head around these inputs, which just befuddled me before. Like, what's a quarter circle forward? What's an SRK motion? What does that even mean? And just, I mean, you talk about barriers to entry. The fighting game has some, has their own dictionary for oh, yeah. a lot of stuff. Um, yes. But but even beyond that, just being able to have those resources, being able to go into training mode, being able to say, OK, this is this this is a corner combo. I can do a corner combo now and I can yeah. use that in a match. Uh, that seems very hard for me to f wrap my mind around figuring that kind of stuff out in an arcade context. Well. In an arcade context, I mean, the training mode was essentially other people. The training mm -hmm. mode was if you were able to go through and just kind of play the computer, because that was another thing about fighting games is the AI in fighting games in the arcade days was unforgiving. Those were some oh, yeah. input reading jerks. My word. <laughs> AI has always been. I mean, I mean it's, it's tricky. You can never make an AI that fights like a human. Mm -hmm. You just can't. It's it's never the same. And even if you make the AI more forgiving, like the experience you develop is, you know, you're just kind of getting away with stuff like, yeah. you know, even even a dumb player would pick up on what you're doing and eventually start at least blocking it, if not countering it. But, you know, the AI will just let you hit them uh, if you keep doing the same thing over and over. Basically, if it's one of the things <laughs> that they allow you to do. You know, and then when the AI becomes difficult, it's just flat out cheating. And you, especially is SNK games are notorious for this. They'll have a final boss that just will tech yeah. every throw and block yeah. every hit. Yeah, SNK bosses are famous. But just uh, kind of going back to what you're talking about uh, with training and trying to figure stuff out, that was another allure. That was another big thing. We talked about the competitive nature of fighting games. Uh, like that's just one facet of it. Because, and this is something that Mortal Kombat really tapped into, and one of the reasons that it became such a phenom as well is because, in addition to that competitive nature, figuring stuff out and secrets, that also became a massive allure. You had these school, uh, school uh, playground conversations of stuff, you know, hey man, I heard if you did this button combination that Sub Zero will actually like do this. I heard mm -hmm. that if you do this in this stage, if you uppercut uh, the opponent three times on this stage, you'll actually fight a green ninja. You know, trying to figure stuff out, trying to figure out the special moves is one thing. And I still remember as a young kid watching people do special moves while I was just jumping up and doing kicks and heavy punches and stuff like that. And somebody threw a Hadouken in my face. I was like, no, whoa, how do you do that? I want to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> And that's kind of the entry point to stuff like that. But Mortal Kombat really doubled down on it. There was a mystique. There were actual secrets. There was a lore behind the game that people could discover and you could find. But how did you do that? You had to go into the arcade, pay some money to search for yourself. You had to verify these things for yourself. And in order to do that, you had to give more money to Midway. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and Mortal Kombat brought on like a brand new graphic style that we'd never seen before in video games too. So it did a really good job of making itself stand out early on. Yeah. yeah. yeah that was was a, what would you call it? Was that like uh, more of like an anime? I don't know. want to say the wrong word. I, word. I don't care. Oh, it was supposed to be like very realistic. It was. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was it's, photos. It yeah. is. Um, yeah, d- taken from photos. It's actually pretty similar to Donkey Kong Country. Yeah, Donkey Kong. Uh, yeah. The, te- the technique involved. Now, yeah. th- Donkey Kong Country. They did an actual 3D model, but then they yeah. converted it to a sprite. This was doing the right. same thing to a photo, a yeah. photo of a, an actor that they would convert to a sprite, and then it's they like would put the sprites together to make an yeah. animation. Exactly. I was like, right, <laughs> right, right. Motion capture meets like claymation, essentially. It's very unique for video games, though, at that time. Yeah. It yeah. stood mm-hmm. out a lot. I mean, it, it, it was really impressive visually, I, for sure. I can't Which remember. Which is why the violence it. was so pronounced and it felt yeah, so pronounced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They borrowed it from a different game, um, but I can't remember what it was now, but that game was not successful. Pit Fighter. It was, was, it, it was <laughs> Pit Fighter, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I probably I hate that I think, game. I yeah. think it is actually. Yeah, Pit Fighter was not well, good. It just goes to I, show you can you can come up with a cool original idea, but if your actual game sucks, nobody cares. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But that's what happened. You know, you had all these experimental fighting games for so long, but when Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter came out, they were like, okay, this template, this is what fighting games look like. This is what mm-hmm. proper fighting games yeah. look like now and forevermore. And, and like you, you can talk about those those predecessors, but I, I think it becomes obvious from the number of imitators it had afterward that Street Fighter 2 was the definition of a fighting game. Mm -hmm. uh for some time and it 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 seems like it even took a while for games to even find a way to differentiate themselves and even something like mortal Kombat, which had that thing to help it stand out still owes a lot to street fighter in terms of its actual you know gameplay mechanics um and and general setup (laughs) well whereas Whereas Street Fighter kind of has its grounds, has its roots in satisfying gameplay, the early Mortal Kombat games, gameplay-wise, were not very good. But they had that shock factor. They had the lore yep. behind mm-hmm. it. They had the fa- like when Mortal Kombat came out with the fatalities. Like you could beat an opponent, but putting that exclamation mark on it at the end of a match with a finishing move, oh, that was the ultimate catharsis for young gamers. Imagine, just imagine young kids running around the arcade, ripping each other's heads off. Like it was, it's the most beautiful, most terrible thing I can imagine. The um, only, listen, the only reference I have for this is Claytalities in Claytalities. Clay 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 yeah. so, so That's good. what it was a spin on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I have almost no experience with the Mortal Kombat series because my perception of it was always your, you know, trading the actually good gameplay for blood and guts. The blob would just eat them and mm-hmm. they don't exist anymore. They're just part of blob. Yep. <laughs> the cool thing about Mortal Kombat was like just how well it established its lore. Like yep. if you try to go back and look at what Capcom has tried to do for Street Fighter as far as lore goes, like it's it's pretty laughable compared to to what Mortal Kombat does and how it all works together, like to the to the point where like the whole thing is just one giant story now. It's pretty crazy. Right, it, it is. I mean, you, you can say, and I, I don't know too much. Like I said, I just don't know much about Mortal Kombat specifically. It does seem like fighting games as a whole do struggle with uh, having a cohesive story just because of the nature of giving, you know, a dozen plus. I mean, these days a dozen is nothing, but giving a dozen plus characters to choose from and letting the player lead that character to victory over the course of usually a tournament means how do you, how do you even define a story for the sequel? You know, there has to be like a canon winner. Yeah. And I mean, you almost need to even establish that a modern Mortal Kombat game is basically like an interactive story that has like planned fights and like, it's, it's insane. Like, how well they yeah. put it together. What was the what was the DC crossover deal that they did? Mortal Kombat Injustice versus DC 
or yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the actual crossover. Now I did play a decent amount of injustice, that which like? was made by Nether Realm. <laughs> they actually well, that that like? they tie it in too. Yes, no, they I'm do. I'm sure they do. That's why I want to know. Like, yeah, <laughs> Nether Realm. Realm, be, Nether Realm, Realm be on Wikipedia tonight. <laughs> some metaverse stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Nether Realm really honed the whole. Like, they're basically the standard bearer when it comes to fighting game story modes, fighting game single player content. At this point, the the first time they really did that story mode, that version of story mode, which really kind of became famous in Mortal Kombat Nine, the rebooted Mortal Kombat in twenty eleven. They did it in MK versus DC, where Shao Kahn and Dark Side, Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat, Dark Side from DC, obviously splintered the universe effectively and they actually combined there was this universal this fracture, such a DC comics fracture. Thing. yeah that absolutely like dc comics yeah big time yeah and they explained the characters fighting each other even the good guys versus the other good guys as this dimensional fracture causing this quote-unquote rage phenomenon where they would just basically just turn into berserkers and that was also the explanation given for why somebody like Liu Kang could actually fight, stand toe to toe with someone like Superman is this rage uh, phenomenon kind of put everybody on equal footing, I guess. But yeah, Superman's yeah, overrated. Right. I mean, the, 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 big, the big constraint you do have with a fighting game story is you basically the story has to somehow justify why every character is fighting every other character, potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, and that's especially, in the, yeah, especially in the early days of the arcades, the story was basically just a pretense. Yeah, I right. mean, this is a tournament. Everyone's fighting. Now, even back then, though, what fighting games lacked in story, per se, they made up for in characters. You know, oh, you yeah. have very strong, identifiable characters with a lot of personality. Very strong, Even identifiable, very little or, characters. Or you, you, you just they do have very little in the way of actual, you know, dialogue or things to actually do as far as a story. Yep. Other you than just do what Smash, you just do what Smash Brothers does. Like, oh no, all the characters are possessed. So you just fight the possessed <laughs> version of that character. It's fine. It's, they're all possessed. Don't worry about it. You're not fighting Donkey Kong. You're fighting zombie mind control Donkey Kong. It's fine. Just do it. Just fight. The funny thing was is for whatever reason they would give, a, for a lot of it, it was just the developers saying, okay, well, we'll just do this and we'll go with it. They completely underestimated, a lot of developers completely underestimated how invested people would actually get in this game. Once you get invested in the game itself, you want to know more about the game. You want to get deeper into the lore. People started caring more about the lore between Street, uh, behind Street Fighter Mortal Kombat because the games themselves were so engaging. So they were kind of forced to say, okay, well, we've created something now crud i guess we actually have to put some thought into building it up now mm-hmm. yeah mortal kombat went as far as to like create spin-off games that would literally just tell a story mm-hmm. like a side story of why these Sub-Zero. characters zero mortal yeah. kombat mythology sub-zero yep and then they stopped <laughs> well, they had, like shaolin monks and like they've had a, there's a lot of mortal kombat games out there that there's a couple, yeah. Shaolin Monks was actually pretty good. Special Forces on the PlayStation yep. should honestly should never be brought up. I apologize for even mentioning it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were they were even talking about doing a Mortal Kombat like a proper Mortal Kombat RPG for a while. Yep. Now, have any that. of you played Mortal Pong Bat? Mortal Mortal, no. Mortal Pong Bat is a very that's a lot. Um, that's fake news. That that doesn't no. exist. Mortal Pong Bat is Pong, except it's like you have like power ups and fatalities, and it's two player, and it's it's amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> Look it up. Mortal Pong Bat. Mortal Pong Bat. I'll have to check it's, that out. It is not a fighting game, so I, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm here to just give you random tidbits of things that are not about fighting games. I'll leave that's, now. That's awesome. I'll come back. I'll come I, back later. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, just just kind of it's kind of walking through that kind of history. We talked about Street Fighter Two. We yeah. talked about it had a lot of imitators. I don't know if anybody oh, has yes. like a favorite Street Fighter Two knockoff that you played a lot. Mine would probably be Turtles Five. I still consider that pretty much a Street Fighter Two knockoff. I oh, probably played more the Turtles ones. Five than than the actual Street Fighter. Well, I mean, basically everything that came after Street Fighter Two and Mortal Kombat was in some way trying to emulate those games some were more uh some were more overt than others mm-hmm. but i mean just just based on the number of fighting games that came out that had finishing moves in them even rare co-opted that mechanic for yeah. their own game right. yeah I mean, and, right. and at some point and and it, just to jump right to it you know, you know this this got so prevalent at, at yeah. some point specifically data east's fighting history um was a game that capcom sued over for being so similar to street fighter interestingly enough i don't know that this is the most blatant ripoff but i guess it was maybe high profile enough they thought it was a threat to them uh and also especially with characters sharing visual similarities plus having very similar moves because it did have this whole like weak point system which is something we've never seen in street fighter um capcom lost the lawsuit so this is this was a suit in u.s court by the way so this was capcom usa inc versus data east corp is the the official title of the lawsuit uh capcom would lose it was basically very you know it it was observed by the court that (laughs) this was very much imitating street fighter um, but uh, essentially the ruling was that most of these elements Capcom was complaining about were stolen, um, were, uh, essentially constituted something that in copyright law is known as a scene affair. I, hmm. I don't speak French. I'll, I'll, I may have butchered that. Um, but basically this is something that that's a longstanding basis of us copyright law that basically says, if an element is so prevalent in a genre that it basically has to be there for a work to be that genre, you can't copyright claim it. Um, so th- this uh, has been applied a lot to things like movies. Yeah. Like if you, you, you can't complain about, you know, your competitor's spy movie having like a femme fatale character, because that's just what makes it a spy movie. Like you yeah, can't, right. that's not yeah. a, it's not a copyright thing. <laughs> Seth um, loves this. They actually specifically cited spy movies in the judgment in that case. Saying it's like, well, mm-hmm. if you're watching a spy movie, you expect to see gadgets. You expect to see, you know, some over the top villain stroking a cat while he's holding his. Like, there are just certain things you expect to see to make it a spy movie that define it as a spy movie. So. Yeah, Capcom. In, in, a, in a lot of ways, ways, like this is what kind of makes that case a very interesting point is that you know legally fighting games became identifiable as a genre now you know yeah. because we basically have a court ruling at least at least for americans i don't know about the yeah. rest of the world but if you're american uh we can say that fighting games have health bars and super moves and ko's and timeouts mm-hmm. um <laughs> yeah. it's just kind of kind of you know it, it is you know Kind of to the point that before, and you can talk about there were fighting games before Street Fighter 2. Obviously, there was Street Fighter 1, for example. That doesn't um, exist. Not a very but, good fighting game. Uh, <laughs> even Data East, in their, in their defense of themselves, brought up um, uh, their previous arcade game, uh, Karate Champ as uh, well this is the real first fighting game. So actually, oh, Capcom snap. stole it from us. Yeah. Um, oh, man. But, you know, for better or for worse, like Street Fighter 2 is what really like consolidated all this into one thing. And even to go back to that, that question of like, does Smash Bros count? I think it does. I think fighting games needs to be as broad as we can push those boundaries because we don't want to just imitate Street Fighter. But we want to build on Street Fighter. Like Street Fighter is always going to be there. It's always going to be something we learn from as what you know when you make a fighting game you're basically trying to capitalize on what people like about street fighter um but 
you also don't want to just make the same thing. You want to, you want to take it in a different direction. And I think there is room under a big umbrella and you can, you can subcategorize them, call them platformer fighters, whatever. I don't know what something like arms counts as, but I call it a fighting game, but it I is, will yeah. recognize it is a very different kind of fighting game. Absolutely. And I like that about it, that it's a very different kind of fighting game. Probably. Uh, I mean, when you break down Smash Brothers into its most basic elements, it's just four player, very simplistic Street Fighter that isn't even really that simplistic. If you break down what's happening under the hood in Smash Brothers, it's as complex, it can be as complex as doing any single move in Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. In it's a just lot that, of ways, more complex, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, like, the fact that there are like snobs who will come up and say like, well, that's a party game. It's like, yeah, sure, sure can be. Also go watch some competitive smash and tell me that's not a fighting game. So yeah, I mean, I it was in Evo for decades. So I mean, yeah. Well, and, and yeah. And, and like, I, I can co- I can totally understand. Like if you're into street fighter and you're not into smash bros and I can even understand getting a little bit of a chip on your shoulder when the most watched event at Evo is smash bros. Uh, especially if you play something that's not even street fighter, if you play mortal Kombat or you play Tekken Mm -hmm. and you're like, Hey, this is cool too. Um, and and like, not everybody has to be into everything. Right. I I think it's just, just kind of finding that way to communicate like, Hey, there's a big tent. There's room for more things in here. Um, it doesn't all have to play the same. Um, you can't stake too much on what we call a fighting game or not. I just don't know what else you'd call it if fighting wasn't in there somewhere. Yeah, for sure. I mean, how many people are watching Rise of the Robots at Evo? Come on. I would totally watch Rise of the Robots at Evo. But, <laughs> there you go. But, but it's been... One of the problems that so many people kind of stay close to... I mean, because Street Fighter 2 was and still very much is the template to this day... Mm-hmm. That's still what people think of when it comes to fighting games. And a large part of what make people kind of reticent to try something wildly new with fighting games is because of what happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, where the genre almost like full on died. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. in the mid to late 90s, fighting games, well, the entire industry essentially was going through puberty. It was going through Mm -hmm. adolescence. And... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and but instead of just getting a slightly deeper voice the video games industry had an entire extra dimension to deal with and all the different genres all the different games that were out there all of a sudden had to try to figure out how to incorporate this new this third dimension into their games because it was just understood that that was the future of gaming everything has yep. to be 3D now that's how and you got all 3D so you do you have 3D, to, man. not really it all so comes you had, back to balls <laughs> stop with the balls so you, so you had platformers mario 64 comes out and shows the you know shows the world okay this is how we do platformers now in the age of 3d all the studios that were doing fighting games were waiting for someone to really show the industry how to do 3d fighting games. It took Namco three tries to get Tekken right, but they ultimately did. But mortal, mortal Kombat, Kombat four, mortal Kombat <laughs> four crashed and burned. And there were still yeah, a absolutely. lot of people that, that still don't even talk about the, the 3d trilogy that came after that deadly Alliance deception and Armageddon, which I actually have a really yep. soft spot in my heart for deception personally, but, three of them. Yeah, even there was an entire. A lot of people don't know this. There was an entire series series of 3D Street Fighter games developed by Arika called mm-hmm. the Street Fighter EX series, but it, but it, they just weren't able to recapture really yeah. recapture the magic of of that. And in the late '90s, as we were getting more arcade perfect experiences at home. People weren't shoving as many quarters into arcade cabinets anymore. All of a sudden, you didn't have to have a fighting game to be profitable. And yeah. the rise of the first-person shooter was a big thing. So Nintendo, and- Nintendo perfected 3D fighting games with the NES. <laughs> but with Punch-Out, come on, guys. 
Mm. It's, it's very good. <laughs> I don't know if it's. It well, does have more Thanks. dimensions of movement per se, but the way you kind of snap back to that center position is a little bit different from, I think, what the goal of 3D fighting game meant to most people. They did find that multiplayer mode in Super punch Ev recently. That's true. Yeah, it's more of true. a fighting game than I thought. Because one of the things I go to in defining it is an emphasis on player versus player, or even even if you're playing against an AI, you're playing against an AI that doesn't have any different abilities that you couldn't have. If you like, you're playing against a character you could be playing as. It's right? theoretically a balanced. It's theoretically a balanced fight until yes. you get to a boss. As I said, there's some early that's early off. Games they spam that super moves. That. <laughs> Most bosses uh, don't, but yeah. And then there's stuff like Red Earth, which is kind of like going back to the, backwards to that, but still using a lot of the conventions of fighting games as defined. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it, it is interesting that transition to 3D hit a lot of genres tough, fighting games especially. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, Virtual <laughs> Fighter seemed to do pretty good in arcade when it originally released well so so virtua fighter if i understand correctly the initial game actually is still all the actual fighting is confined to a 2d axis it does have 3d graphics though yes yeah Yeah, vf2 was instrumental in the ultimate transition to 3d for that and actually a couple genres just because of not even just the gameplay mechanics, but visually how they represented a 3d space was something that a lot of other developers uh, took to heart. So, well, and and it's, it's just interesting to note that like street fighter tried it and Mm -hmm. failed. And Mm -hmm. and obviously they, they, they kind of set that out to a different team. Um, and they would they would ultimately just for Street Fighter three go back to what they knew, right? Yep. Um, whereas the these these three D fighters that became successful, primarily Virtua Fighter and Tekken, and sort of as an extension to Tekken, Soul Edge and Soul Calibur, since that's yep. still Namco, very much using the same um, engines a lot of the time, um, kind of just carved out their own space. Uh, as as a thing and and you do still see uh, not to not to always bring it back to the to the smash bros discussion but i do think it's kind of interesting within like the fighting game space um the 2d fighting game players have a certain respect i think for that at least compared to how they might treat smash bros (laughs) they don't always cross pollinate they don't always respect each other perfectly but there is a certain like, I guess it's just because like Tekken has been around enough. Like you, you know, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, whereas Smash Bros, at least as a competitive game, maybe still seems novel or still seems a bit too strange. Um, but I, I think just to go back to that, like, three D fighters had to be something different. And like, cause you can't fall back on the way street fighter worked. Like a big, a big part of street fighters, special moves is projectiles. And in a 3d fighter projectiles don't make any sense. Cause you can just sidestep them. Mm. Like <laughs> yep. they're, they're very, they're too easy to deal with. There's no such thing as zoning really in most 3d fighters. Um, no, not unless your projectile you, can hit multiple areas yeah. at once. So, so the 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 actual fundamental gameplay becomes about something a little bit different. You know, it, it, it's it's not so much about like the frame traps and the zoning pressure as it's about like being able to juggle or counter or guard break or things like that, which. Conversely, if you try to put some of those things back into a 2D fighter, it doesn't always work well. Well, I mean, it always depends. Uh, we've seen some really interesting, uh, some really interesting ideas in both the 2D and 3D aspect. Kind of, you know, use the term cross pollinate. I'll use it here. Kind of cross pollinate between you know each mm-hmm. other. Soul Calibur did. Uh, Soul Calibur, by the way, still the highest reviewed fighting game ever released. Uh, Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast still has, I believe, a 98 on Metacritic. But just like 
kind of the big calling card for Street Fighter 3 was this whole parry thing. Street Fighter the mm -hmm. Third Strike wind up becoming kind of a cult classic based on its parry mechanic. You know, Soul Calibur did something very similar to that. They had their own type of parry mechanic. Dead or yeah. Alive had something very similar to that with their like kind of counter throws and stuff like that. So, you know, they're still very different types of fighting games, but they're like those developers were still watching each other. They were still looking at what the other person next to them was doing. And we've, we've got some really good games out of it. Once they cut, once they got comfortable with adding a third dimension to games and a couple companies said, you know what? 2d fighting games, you know, we can have 3d assets, but we're always going to be on a 2d plane. That's, that's just, that's what we're going to do. There are 3D games out there, the Tekkens, the Virtual Fighters, the Soul Calipers. They can have the 3D realm, you know, but Killer Instinct, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, we are perfectly happy being a 2D mm -hmm. fighter. And, and I think that's reflective of just a wider trend in gaming where it, any genre, like it's okay to be 2D now. Like <laughs> people have realized like, and, and this is something that like, not that I dislike, you know, the, the N64 or or the PlayStation 2 or, or anything like that. But I mean, a lot of what drove me to retro gaming was the realization that the games I liked most were these 2D games that people weren't making anymore. Um, and, and through my teen years, realizing going back to those, I was having more fun playing them. Um but I think now with with the indie space, but even, you know, you even see triple A games come out, especially in the fighting game space, which there's still big releases. There's still a big deal, even even as fighting games become something of kind of a niche genre for a lot like people still know and respect Street Fighter, even if they know they're not going to play it a lot. They're not going to master it. They don't have what it takes to master it. <laughs> um, they know it's a big deal and they treat it like a big deal. Um, but it, yeah, I, d I do just want to give a quick shout out though, to those like late nineties Capcom releases, because that's something I've been discovering lately, just coming to it as somebody who missed them when they were new. Um, Capcom fighting collection came out. Dude, oh my course. God. That made me so and happy. Dark stalkers is just to me, peak Capcom fighting game. Um, it, it just hits a great balance between the absolute insanity of stuff like Marvel versus Capcom and the more fundamental driven stuff like Street Fighter um, that just I don't think it can be matched. And, and they just they went nuts with the character design and I love it for that all the more just having these monsters that every single sprite is just ridiculous in the amount of like almost even characters that shouldn't by any means like be transforming like just have their whole arm transform into something else for a single punch and it's great i love that i love that <laughs> yeah. stuff yeah dark stalkers is special that's i mean it is. there's been a small vocal minority desperate for a new dark stalkers game we got Iron Galaxy did Darkstalkers Resurrection back on the Xbox 360, mm -hmm. PS3. Uh, we just got the Capcom Fighting Collection that you just said. Uh, there's actually a couple fighting, a uh, couple Darkstalkers games in the Capcom Second Arcade Stadium as well. Uh, but yeah, for for online versus, yeah, if you're even remotely interested in fighting games, definitely pick up Capcom, the Capcom Fighting Collection because even in addition to Darkstalkers, there were a couple games late nineties, early two thousands from Capcom that that are really being reevaluated now through a modern mm -hmm. eye. It's like, Oh, that was actually really cool. Games like Cyberbots full metal madness, which is also in the Capcom fighting collection is a fantastic, completely over the top, mm -hmm. basically street fighter with mechs. That's the best way to describe yeah. it. That's also a ton of fun pocket fighter slash, uh, and Super Gym Fighter, Fighter is, is is great if you're yeah. you know looking for something a bit more approachable. Yeah, um, it, it is. It kind of has like a. You know, I mean, it basically has items in it. I mean, it, it's it is a party fighter. It's yep. it's basically if somebody wanted to make a a Smash Bros or Power Stone, but wanted to confine it within the normal two D fighter space. That's that's what Pocket Fighter is. Yeah. 
And yeah, I, you've got stuff like Project Justice and Rival Schools. You've got stuff like, uh, I mean, Power Stone is one of my favorite fighting games of all time. I adore mm-hmm. Power Stone. I desperately wish they would make another one. So, I mean, Capcom there is still... There is an alleged leak that indicates one is on the way, but we'll we'll see. Yeah, there's we'll been see what it actually, actually looks for like a long too. time, so we'll see. Falcon has showed up. Uh, Power Stone characters have shown up occasionally mm-hmm. in other games. Falcon appears in the background of Capcom or Mar- yeah, Capcom versus SNK two, and appears as Easter eggs in several other Capcom fighting games. So, I mean, we'll see. I would love nothing more, nothing more than to see Power Stone three or a Power Stone collection come out. So, Capcom. I've done it. They've done it once. They can do it again. On the PSP of all things. Yeah. Oh, come on. It's Uh, it's all right. The last thing I just want to hit on, which is really a a big turning point, is is that after that low period in fighting games was very much a fighting game renaissance. Um, And a lot of this is driven by, as as we noted before, playing against AI just doesn't cut it. So what do you do? Well, when you have the ability to play online... That suddenly makes fighting games appealing when you don't have an arcade to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, I I see this as actually starting before uh, rollback netcode really took off. But it yeah. definitely that was like gasoline on the fire when when rollback netcode came along. But I think Street Fighter Four again. I mean, Street Fighter does still define the genre for better or for worse. Um, Street Fighter 4 coming out, obviously about a 10-year period between 3 and 4, I think. Maybe longer? Uh, well, 3 Third okay. Strike came out, and that was kind there of the other games. Yeah, yeah, and there were other about, games. It was about six years between, I think, Third Strike and 4. I think Third Strike came out late 2001, 2002, and I believe Street Fighter 4 was 2008 time frame. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you know the Street Fighter. There's like five different versions of every Street Fighter game. Right. So, I mean, Street Fighter 2 alone had Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 2 Hyper Fighting, Championship Edition, Hyper, Turbo, Super Turbo. And now, you know, you've got Ultra Street Fighter 2, you've got Street Fighter 2 HD. So, (laughs) that's just what Capcom does. So, yeah. Well, and I guess for me personally, I really latched on to Street Fighter 4 as a turning point because this was the first, as I said, I kind of gradually got pulled into fighter games. And into fighting games through Smash Bros, through going to the past. This was the first, like, new release leading up. I was, like, watching character trailers. I was logging on to event hubs, like, every day to see if any new info came out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who am I going to main? Who is it going to be? And, of course, I always always play low-tier garbage characters that won't come back in the next game. So I have to ask (laughs) that question constantly. I main Hakan and El Fuerte. I like Hakan. I like Hakan, too. I think we're the only ones. (laughs) I think we are, actually. (laughs) He he wasn't a human. I don't know what he was. That character design was was uh, out of person. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's something. He 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 got a cameo in five, um, yeah. but that's 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 all he gets now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it very it, it just yeah. But I mean, obviously, Street Fighter Four by today's standards doesn't have the best net code. But really, I mean, just think about the changes over those years. I mean, the idea of playing online with anybody was just so huge. And to actually have it be serviceable in a fighting game, um, which this was, um, I know, like, at this point, what was it? Mortal Kombat 10 was what was, like I said, Mortal Kombat, I don't have a great... um, Mortal Kombat X came out in 2015, so... Okay, so this would be before that. Whatever the latest Mortal Kombat was, I know was getting skewered for its online, not being up to snuff. probably probably nine. This was the one. Yeah, I mean, nine would be before ten, assuming they didn't do some spinoff thing. Did you hear what <laughs> um, happened to? Um, did you hear what happened to seven? Oh God! Uh, what seven, happened to seven? Seven, eight, nine. <laughs> yeah. I'm still here, by the way. Hi, Dan. Glad you're here. 
I, I, I hope you're learning something. I do. I do. I hope all my rantings and ravings are, you know, you know, it's uh, it's going in one ear at the very least. Nice. Well, he's got <laughs> he's got headphones in, so hopefully those headphones keep it from going out the other ear. Yeah, it's not spilling out. I don't know what's going to happen when I take the headphones off, but for now, it's in there. <laughs> but certainly, you know, online play. Um, so where we may not have seen fighting games blowing up on the PlayStation Two or the Xbox per se, um, and, and some of this may have been that fighting games didn't have a home. Because because really, like Sega was the home of fighting games post Genesis, maybe not so much on the Genesis where they were late to get Street Fighter. Um, obviously, they got the Mortal Kombat with the blood and all that. But yeah. I mean, the Saturn, the Dreamcast were usually the best ports of fighting games. To yeah, my the, Dream, the Dreamcast was a fantastic home for fighting games. Not only did the Dreamcast have Power Stone 1 and Power Stone 2, they had the best versions of, like, they mm-hmm. had the best version of Third Strike. They had the best version of and, Marvel and versus usually Capcom. the ones and, that were tournament standard as well yeah. for that reason. Yeah, so if you were a fighting game enthusiast, you probably had a Dreamcast. It was, it was insane how many fantastic fighting game ports were on the Dreamcast. Uh, if you somehow were able to get an AES and Neo Geo uh, and you had that money, the Neo Geo also, we've talked about this before, SNK, practically all they made was fighting games. Even mm-hmm. when they weren't making fighting games, they were making fighting games. Stuff like War of the Monsters is a good example of that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah. And so I, I think, I think with that decline, like you didn't even have like a system that really. I can't think of a whole lot of fight. Obviously there are some, um, yeah. and obviously like stuff like Tekken was still going strong at this point, stuff like soul Calibur on like the PS2 Xbox, but the PS3, um, 360, you had online, right? You had Xbox live and that mm-hmm. made the difference that set the stage for fighting games to come back. Even if they had to work out some kinks and the all important net code and, I mean, this was the time when I really got into like the new releases. So it wasn't just Street Fighter Four. I mean, I I, I started playing um, the latest in Soul Calibur and Tekken as well. My brother was getting into a lot of these too. So and that was what drove a lot of it as well. Is I meanwhile owned a Wii, but he you know actually went out and bought a PS3, so we could actually play these. At least when I was around him, I could play these, um, and. You know, even stuff like uh, Blay Blue was one I really liked a lot. Um, And I know he was really into Street Fighter Cross Tekken, actually, at one point. I never really (laughs) could get into that. It was an interesting game. I like Blay Blue. It was an interesting game. Marvel came back, Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom 3. Um, And, uh, I mean, yeah, it definitely felt like fighting games were back. And a big part of that was online and especially GGPO or rollback netcode, which um, if people don't know what that is, um, we should probably explain. Uh, (laughs) That is it's basically a a way of programming um, fighting games not just fighting games, actually a way of programming games, uh, multiplayer games such that the game will predict your inputs, uh, so that everything remains completely smooth. And then it will roll back. Um, if there is a conflict in the actual inputs received and what was predicted. So this means everything can continue seamlessly, even if the connection is very briefly delayed or interrupted. Um, now you are going to, especially if your connection's weak, you are going to have very visible stutters when that rollback happens. Uh, and I think this is part of when people were discussing this. A lot of people were slow to adopt this. Um, sometimes there was a priority over making sure the game looked smooth, which often meant it didn't feel smooth because there would usually be delay on inputs, but visually the game would look like it's running fine. Whereas with rollback, you would see visible stutters when the rollback happened, but a player that knows what he's doing could rely on his muscle memory and never drop a combo, um, which was part of the important thing there. So suffice it to say, rollback netcode is the gold standard for for online play in fighting games today. It's even getting used in things that aren't fighting games. 
Yep. Um, I actually saw there is a, um, it, it's interesting. There is a, I brought up battle network earlier. There is a online battle network net battle emulation community, and they have developed rollback net code for Mega Man battle network. <laughs> <laughs> So I looked it up, and the game that you were thinking of that released at the same time as Street Fighter Four would have been uh, Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe. Versus DC, okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll say, when it comes to fighting games, a big thing about the entire genre is the fact that the audience for this genre, like the FGC, the fighting game community, they're not just enthusiasts of a genre. Like it's this actual, you know, like competitive community of a bunch of different fandoms. And that's one of the things that drives the entire genre is this incredibly passionate. I'm going to spend $500 to go to Evo myself type of enthusiasm. And because it's the people driving the genre so much, I would, I would be very, very interested, very interested to see a version of history and where fighting games were today had Daigo dropped his parry. Mm -hmm. And what I'm referencing there for anybody who might not know, maybe the most famous moment. Oh, no, in I know history. what you're talking about. Yeah, but for the listeners, but. No, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have no uh, idea. But for those who might not know who I'm talking about, Arguably the most famous moment in the history of competitive games happened in the early 2000s uh, at Evo playing Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, Justin Wong versus Daigo Umahara, a moment known as Evo Moment 37, where Daigo Umahara parried the entire 15 hit super from Chun Li, followed up with a round ending combo to much rejoicing. And it just kind of became this iconic moment, this moment in time for the entire fighting game genre. And there were a lot of people, a lot of people that started to become interested in the genre because of that. Uh, and I'm not going to say that without that moment, fighting games wouldn't be what they were today. But because of how community driven the genre is. I'm just going to say I would be very interested to see what the fighting game community would look like today without Evo Moment 37. Yeah. That's pretty and cool, actually. In the interest of time and my own <laughs> lack of personal experience with it, I, oh, I, I could won't go, go too much into the detail of, of the FGC as a whole. But I, I will note for those who aren't even remotely familiar that um, – one of the things that's interesting about it is it's always been pretty much a grassroots underground thing. Um, so much to the point where, I mean, it, 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 it's always been kind of led by, you know, the actual players uh, because these were the people who kept the games running when there was no money in it. Um in certain circles of the FGC, the word esports is kind of a dirty word because <laughs> it's synonymous with being a sellout. Um, whether or not that's correct or whatever, but it, it's it is interesting. It certainly has its own character because it's kind of developed in a vacuum um, of just players who were just very dedicated to their games. And yeah, the FGC is certainly there's insularity game. that comes with that, and there is uh, there's also some some things admirable about that too. Do you guys remember the uh, snafu with Street Fighter X Tekken about the on disc DLC? Well, yeah, there is a lot of stuff, a lot of similar stuff mm -hmm. around that time. Street oh, Fighter yeah. Cross Tekken was not. Uh, it was not remotely the only guilty party when it comes oh, to no. having DLC on just, disc. They were the ones that got roasted for it, though. Yeah. Well, and it, it's it's a they sign of because it's how still far we've come. Because I, I remember oh, yeah. Capcom going so far as to say they would never do DLC characters because of the the issue of somebody feeling like they had to you know they had to buy the DLC to stay competitive just so they could you know actually like practice against this character offline. Um, but that's par for the course in every game now because there's just too much money in it. 
Which um, stinks because that was one of my favorite things about playing classic fighting games is so many classic fighting games had unlockable characters. You'd play oh, yeah. through the arcade mode, you'd play through whatever single player content was in the game, and you could unlock more characters to play as. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is a fantastic example of that. I just, I love that thrill of, you know, having a character playing through with character and being rewarded with more options for gameplay, more different ways to play the game. I love that. That was some of the most pure doses of serotonin that I've ever been injected with in my gaming life is just unlocking characters on loop in those retro fighting games. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, that's, that's really, uh, again, just sort of, what it all comes down to is is those moments that that competition, whether it's, you know, whether it, it is Evo or whether it's, you know, just you finally being able to to beat your brother at Smash Bros. You know, it's, uh, it, that's that's kind of the that's the pull. Um, and and it, can, it can be downright addictive at times. Um, yes, it can. And really, like that is the the. It, that's that is the strength and the weakness of the genre because it's it's so compelling because of competition but it's so competitive that you can just get burned out so quickly so fast and i found that with online too is like man there is always somebody better and i could train for hours every day and not be the best and you know what? I got other stuff I want to do. I, heck, I just have other games I want to play. Not yeah. even important stuff to do. So yeah. it, it can definitely like you. You have to find a way to enjoy it without it becoming um, too discouraging or, or just you know realistic expectations. Like I am, I am going to plateau in the rankings, uh, and, and I've kind of made my peace with that, but. You know, there's so many of these games that, like, I wish I had the time to get really good at, and I I just don't. Yeah, I play most fighting games, so I don't put the time in to get amazing at any of them. But this is something you mentioned a little earlier, Sam, and this is something I mentioned during our episode of SideQuest. Please subscribe to our Patreon that I will echo here, and that is... Of everything that we've talked about when it comes to fighting games and the allure and, you know, why people enjoy them, there are few more magical moments that I have been a part of playing video games than finding somebody in a fighting game at my skill level. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately what it comes down to for me. That's one of the biggest draws you can try to find. You can talk about the best in the world or whatever, but for so many people, the, the, the joy of experiencing the games themselves is finding somebody on their level. I'm never going to be at Evo top eight as much time as I spend on fighting games, but I will like some of my favorite moments playing games have been finding randos online that were around my skill level and just going like 20 sets. And like that, that is addicting. That's almost like a drug when you can find that level of competition Mm -hmm. in your life. Well, and it's even better if if it can be somebody that, you know, in real life too. And it's like, (laughs) Like you were sort of training for the next time you meet them, you know, it's, it's like, Oh, I got, I got to, you know, my brother's going to be on spring break. I I better, (laughs) I better make sure I know how to beat King DVD. It's like you're a Pokemon rival. I think Pokemon taps into that same mindset, even if it's a completely different gameplay experience, it it is very much about rivalry. Mm -hmm. I want to be the very best. Like no I, one ever I, was. Well, you're like, on you're on that quest right now in Kanto, so I am. <laughs> Gary, Gary can suck a duck. <laughs> suck a side duck. Big fat one. Well, that is about all I have in me. Um, we could go on forever. There are really a lot could. of fighting games, as it turns out. Uh, but we do have the community couch. So 
Uh, we real still quick, have the Danverse to get through, We do guys. still have the Danverse, <clears throat> which is part of uh, the untold story of Retrologic and our, our quest. Last time on Enter the Danverse, Sam and John were able to secure the first Odama Ball with the help of Solid Snake Kirby and Flightsy, the price charting dragon. Unfortunately, a mysterious watcher, two dollar villain, was spying on them. We cut to a year ahead of time where Sam and John have gotten the seven Odama Balls and are ready to bring back Light Dan from the Game Over World. What a crazy year it's been trying to get those seven Odama balls. You're telling me we had to win that Dance Dance Revolution contest. Garfield died three times on three different accounts. <laughs> Xenoblade 4 came out and we had to kill the dog from Duck Hunt to get the fifth ball. Don't forget that I married and divorced the Sea Witch from Cuphead. Flightsy digivolved into a jet fighter plane, and half my body is cyborg after the Eliminator boat duel accident. Beep boop. Who could forget those times? I'm still a little bit hazy after we both had to drink a bucket of Splatoon paint in order to transport to Dreamland and help Bomberman find golden ch- the Golden Chalice of Life. Hold on, wait, pause. Why, why didn't we get any of this in... I, Ambassador, please write these scripts. Can we like go back in time and do these things? Sorry, just wanted to say that. Uh, continue. Good times. And you couldn't have done it without me. Two dollar... Vi- uh, I mean, hero. I am your best ally and friend with no ulterior motive to backstab you. And don't you think for one second that I am just collecting these balls to bring back Dark Dan so he will... Let me take over Retro Logic. Two Dollar Hero, you've been a wonderful friend and asset to our team. I don't even regret giving you my bank account information. From the plains of Retroland, where the slimes and drakes dance happily, Jetsy, the fighter plane, rushes towards Sam and John. Solid Kirby is riding on his wings. All right, you weebs, it's time to get back Light Dan and unite Retro Land once and for all. How should we get the ritual started? I almost forgot the whole point of going to the Sacred Egg Mountain so we could do the ritual. I think we just put the Odama balls into a circle and chant the magical Nintendo phrase, which will bring him back. I'm ready. Let's go. Of course, I'm going to do what you say. Uh, please pardon my shifty eyes, though. All right, everyone in unison, I guess. Now you're playing with power. 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 At first, nothing happens as the team holds their breath. Then, with a trickle of light and an explosion of generic anime effects, a figure appears in the center of the Odama Balls. Wait a minute. Is that... Psych! It's me, Dark Dan, in the flesh! Booyah, dummies! You got played worse than my PS Vita after a night of Uncharted. How could this have happened? We did all the right things. We even followed the player's guide. Sam looks at the player's guide and notices the cover on it was fake. Upon ripping off the cover, he sees the real name of the guide is... Tricks and tips how to unlock Dark Dan. Who could have seen this coming? Holy Gunstar Heroes, I think one of us is a mole. Suddenly, the mole from Super Mario 3 sticks his head out from a manhole and throws a wrench at Sam. I mean a figurative mole. It was me the whole time! I played you like an ocarina at a third grader's recital. Now, my master... Dark Dan is here, and he will give me my most coveted prize. Yeah, should have known. Or, <laughs> I knew we should have recruited Spider Shane and Presto. That's right, dorks. The champion Dan is here. I will remake this world in my image. The image of the DualShock. First, let me make some changes that everyone will have to accept. Number one, the DualShock is way better than the N64 controller. 
Gasp. <laughs> Number two, the PS move is more groundbreaking than the Wiimote. Oh, my virgin ears. And number three, Resistance and Killzone are better than Turok. Um, I can see where he's coming from there. Now that you are the king of Retroland, you can make me the main host of Retrologic. Uh, oh, wow. This is awkward. I may have made that promise a bit too hasty. I kind of put Parappa the Rapper in charge of Retrologic. He has a voice for radio and he's hella cute. You can be the host of PlayStation Moms, a new podcast. Uh, you, you, you lied to me? After all I did for you? I resurrected 989 Studios. I brought back a sequel to Siphon Filter. And I, I doubled the retro value of NFL Game in 98. Do you know how hard that is? Look. Look to Dogma Vanilla. No one understands those references. I appreciate you being a team player, but now I'm in charge. As we say in the PlayStation world, you were hot for a second, but now you're in the bargain bin of EB Games. Two dollar villain starts to charge up his anger. And he becomes a fusion ball of energy. He's going to blow and kill us all. Kirby, you're the only one who can stop this. Absorb the energy. Make like the online community of Mario Strikers and suck. <laughs> My name is Two Dollar But it's too late. Kirby is unable to save them. The whole mountain is covered in bright light. I think two dollar villain's energy is having weird effects on Dark Dan. You fool! Do you know what you've done? Cue blinding light and silence. When the dust settles, Dark Dan is gone. Sam and John are face down on the ground. Ugh, I feel like a tsunami of Hello Kitty merchandise hit me in the face. Um, Sam, I don't think we're in Retroland anymore. Where are we? From the shadows, a blue hedgehog holding a master sword and a Hyrule shield appears with his sidekick, Bonk, the bald-headed caveman. Link, the master hog, approaches. Hoyo, hoyo! Gotta go fast! Join us next time for Enter the Danverse Shattered Dimensions EX Mech Mech, uh, Machina No Matching Service Alpha Zero the second. (laughs) And scene. And wow. I got nothing. And that was Enter the Danverse. Congratulations, everyone. We made it through. We are now exiting the Danverse. Yes. Please (laughs) watch your head. Do not bump the the <laughs> post of the door on the way out. Why Why was Dark Dan a uh, surfer dude? That's my question. Maybe because, because deep down... Light Dan is the opposite of a surfer dude. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not a surfer dude, so that's mm-hmm. I guess that tracks. He's your opposite in every way. Yeah, true. We got any questions? Uh, Not so much questions, but we did have some uh, comments on our, I I guess one kind of goes into a question, but we got some feedback from uh, some good listeners of ours on our round table, specifically John's round table topic from last episode, talking about his collection and and where he's at downsizing. So I thought I'd read those. Um, Chris HL 94 says, I am definitely feeling what John described in the last podcast. I have a fairly modest game collection, but I almost never have the time to play them. I keep telling myself I'll play these games one day, like when the kids are older or out of the house or when I have fewer commitments in my life. I also wonder if this time will ever come and should I just sell all these games and play what I have time for? I have a feeling I know what you guys think about this, but I'd be interested in hearing it. Uh, And before we kind of respond to that, I'll just add in Warrior of Wazd. Uh, similar comment. I feel this. I have tons of unbeaten games and a wish list that is just as big. 
I had to redeem my game time by sticking to motion games like the VR and Switch for exercise and multiplayer with my friends to make it a healthy hobby. <laughs> so I, I think we've all been there at some different degrees, maybe uh, collection kind of growing too big for our time. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it's just a side effect of so many games coming out every week now, you know, just more and more at a time. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually and, did a... Oh, I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. When, um, uh, when I was just going to say, when collecting becomes the goal, right? Um, and even if like, you know, because Adam and I are both kind of ha- in the halfway point where it's like, I don't want to collect the entirety of any one thing. I want to collect stuff that I'm that I've played before that I want to play or that I'm interested in playing with the goal being to play. But it is nice to kind of have a library to go to, you know? Um, Yep. Yes. What were you going to say, Eric? I was going to say, Seth and I actually did a top five a week or two ago of top five games. We, you know, are the greatest games from our backlog that we still need to get to just because, Mm -hmm. You know, both of us, our backlogs have, have gotten insanely big just because stuff continues to come out. We try to stay up with it as much as possible. But, you know, with new games, there's a lot of games we want to go back to, a lot of games we want to to keep playing, a lot of games getting new content, and a lot of games that are just kind of meant to be played over a long period of time. I'd love to go back to – I'd honestly love to put more time into Mario Strikers Battle League, love to put more time into stuff like Mario Party Superstars and – new Pokemon snap. So uh, I, the, the backlog is just kind of an eternal thing yeah. unless you only have a couple games. But if you have, even if you just have a small collection like Chris does, like if you want to find the time for it, find the time for it and just play whatever, you know, play whatever you want to play, whatever you want, whenever you can, if you need to make the time, Maybe it's just something to where you need to actually put your schedule down on a piece of paper or down, you know, actually put your schedule into a a phone and set aside some time if it's something you really want to do. Or Mm -hmm. if, you know, if you just want to kind of play it by ear, just, you know, I mean, however it makes you happy, whatever you want to do. Uh, A lot of people approach it differently, but if it's something you're actively trying to find time for, that would be my biggest recommendation is to actually schedule some time out that's a good that's a good thought um and that's kind of what i do um with my collection like there's there's a lot of retro games in my collection that i want to play or want to keep playing and in the summer i kind of tear everything down from the garage and put it in the closet so it doesn't overheat and you know get humid and all that um and then put it back in the garage for the fall winter spring and during those times, I really lean into the portable side of what I have, you know? So, like, I'm playing GBA games, a lot of Nintendo Switch. And a lot of that time I play is, like, lunch breaks at work, honestly. Like, a little bit in the evenings if there's time. But uh, John and I both have, like, families with small children. And that doesn't allot you a whole lot of time for video games. Um, so, you involve the kids where you can. You play by yourself when you can. And you kind of deal with it. But to Chris's concern with like, you know, should he just sell stuff now and like not have a collection or should he try, try to play it or what should he do? Um, you know, like you never it's, for me, it's like you never know what the market is going to do. And when my kids are out of the house in 15 years, what's the retro gaming market going to look like? And that kind of terrifies me as somebody who plans on actually playing these games. So I've chosen to kind of, and I'm even now like kind of completing some collections that I want to have forever. Um, so that when the time comes and I have that time, like I a hundred percent intend on playing them. Um, but if Chris doesn't think that time will ever come and he's okay risking either the games he wants to play being available digitally somewhere on switch or whatever, or risk the prices going up and buying it later. That's just kind of a decision you have to make. And, and, uh, I just can tell you what I'm doing and where I'm at. 
Well, I mean, if he's looking to sell some stuff and open up some time, then, I mean, I'm sure the fair market value for kids right now is <laughs> is is really high. Oh, so. my God. <laughs> More than video games. Eric, get out of here. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. I mean, unless it's something you don't think you're going to get to in quite a while, I'd probably hold on to things just um, – because if it is something you are going to want to play in any kind of recent time, like the current trend for most games is that they go up in value. So right, it would uh, it'd be pretty hard to to let something go and then you know a year later come back and pick it up and it's twenty to thirty dollars more expensive than what you sold it for. So yeah, I mean, ask anybody who's into retro games now; they have stuff they regret selling. Yeah, uh, even stuff that you don't regret, like. There's stuff you only sort of regret selling. Like, it's like, I mean, I would still do it again, but that's because I know I needed money then, you know? Um, yep. But that's obviously not a situation you wanted to be in, um, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, hold on to what you can hold on to. Obviously, there, there's other reasons. And and you, you have to decide, like, okay, there are are these games that I am never going to actually play? Uh, at that point, you might think about what do I do with them? <clears throat> um, I, mean, I think it, it's interesting it's your- what warrior was said too about, you know, kind of looking for the, you know, those games that can kind of double as something else, double as kind of a social um, experience or an ex- exercise. Um, I, I like that. Unfortunately, those are never like the games I most want to play, mm-hmm, but yeah. I get that. Like, I, I definitely get that, especially even just things like multiplayer. Like there is something to be said for, you know, kind of uh, the phrase he uses is making it a healthy hobby. And like, that's not to say games are unhealthy, but like, we know they can be like, it's okay to admit that. Like, yeah. I, I know as people who enjoy video games a lot, we're quick to defend uh, against accusations that they're a waste of time or they're, you know, always addictive or lead to this, that, or the other. But like there, there is definitely an extent to which like you have to look at that and you just have to weigh it against your other priorities. Like, yeah, I want to, I want to play every video game I own and even a lot of the ones I don't, but I want a lot of things in life and I can't do all of them at once. You know, I, I, I want to spend time with, with people I care about. Uh, I want to, you know, do such and such in my career. I want to, you know, read books. I want to, you know, learn a new language potentially, you know, I, like there's just other goals I have and I have to decide, you know, how much time I spend on those as well. So, yeah, you have to yeah. Time I mean, it's just it. a matter of like, what are, what are my priorities? What's what's actually best? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's an individual choice. Uh, and anything can become an addiction or an idol in your life um, <clears throat> if you're prone to that kind of thing. And depending on what you do, but um, you know, being part of a community certainly makes it harder to like <laughs> give up a part of you your life if you, that's the direction you're going in. But Chris, if you decide to get rid of all your video games, you're always welcome at retro logic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I just yeah. if you do decide seeing... to get rid of all your games, let me know what you have. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I mean, I just hate seeing people having to give up their yeah. collections because of financial problems like yeah that stuff yeah. is the worst like if you're thinking about just like hey you know i need to offload this just because i feel cluttered and i know i'm not going to get to it that's one thing but man it that's really strikes that chord whenever you hear somebody it's like it's like man you know it really means something mm-hmm. all right Let's end this three-hour episode, shall we? <laughs> Again, let's, that's do it. let's try to do it. No, let's let Eric uh, just tell everyone where they can find what he's up to, and then uh, we'll close it out. 
again, thank you guys for having me back on Retro Logic. Absolute blast. If you want to hear me talk more about games in general, come over and check out All In a Nintendo podcast. We do a variety show each and every Saturday. Me and my amazing co host, Seth Sturgill, aka $2 Hero. We do a ton of stuff. You can follow us online at all in podcast on Facebook and Twitter on YouTube at youtube.com slash all in podcast on twitch.tv slash all in podcast, where we actually do live, you know, this week in Nintendo news, every Friday night. Um, you should definitely come by this Friday. It would be a nice birthday gift for me, but, um, uh, yeah, uh, patreon.com slash all in podcast. Come check us out. We do a ton, a ton of stuff. This is actually uh, a short episode as far as we're concerned. We do a lot of stuff in the world of Nintendo, so check it out. Yeah, definitely check those guys out over at All In. Um, they're super cool. They do a great show. They put a lot, a lot of hard work into it. We're huge fans at RetroLogic, so oh, yeah. thank you. if you like us, go check them out. Is Sam right. freeze again? That's, oh, okay. That's all. I thought, I thought, I thought Sam I just, no, I'm just <laughs> just mentally. Um, yeah, that's that's all I have. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> you, want me to, well, you, you, want to, you want me to send us out? <laughs> what is happening to the end of this show? <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening to Retro Logic episode 86. I have been Eric alongside co host Dan Caparella. <laughs> it's Sam, the you, uh, you want me to read the outro? Cummins. I'm sorry. I just, my mind is gone. Uh, guys, this is the weirdest show ever when our guest <laughs> is doing our outro script. And he's doing a better job than the script that I wrote. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i'm keeping this in this is all staying in the show nice um, this is we gotta give sam some grace because it's like 1 30 in the morning where he is right now yeah Me too it is exactly 1 30 in the so, morning and i've got to be at work in six hours so Ooh, yeah <laughs> oh, so boy. thanks for listening to the retro logic podcast we are proudly part of the nintendo dads family of podcasts if you like what you hear check me out on twitter and instagram at retro logic games you're also welcome to jump into our friendly and 100 percent non-toxic discord community the link to that is in my twitter bio if you have any retro logic questions concerns needs check out retrologic.games it's our website you can get the discord link merch all the stuff, the blog, go check it out. Just go look. It's cool. That is all. We will see you guys on the next one. Peace out. Bye now. Bye. Bye. bathroom <laughs> no yeah. always have to ask right always gotta ask never gotta go always the peer never the pe only only you and your brother peers i don't do that yeah okay yeah i mean you're the one that said it i'm the one that i'm just agreeing <laughs> okay thank you i basically don't pee i've never used an airplane bathroom in my life so well, is I mean, that the definition? You just and never have to be in an airplane. <laughs> have you flown internationally before? Yes. I mean, I've never used a bathroom in northern Russia before. But... So you never pee either, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Keep this I, in the show. I mean, you can't prove it, right? Exactly. I, poop, I poop 
like often, like probably Fair three times a day. I poop. Very regular. And I, I'm told that's weird, but I don't know. Yeah, that's so, honestly of less concern than like not pooping for three days. I had a friend that would do that, and he would like stay in the bathroom for an hour and get yeah. her done, and then that take a shower. Say, I think I'd rather have that than the alternative. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not friends anymore. He poops because, too, because of that. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Honestly, I once I once had to hold it for two weeks when I was on a mission and with the military. When I got back, mm. <laughs> like genuinely, like I pushed myself up off the seat. Like, <laughs> like it was bad. What, what kind of mission are you doing? Where you can't go to the bathroom for two weeks. It was, it was, it was, it was a crazy mission. That's all I'm saying. I think that was the mission. Like you guys are seeing who could go <laughs> longest. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I guess oh I accepted. I, I guess I, I won. I hope you yeah. won. That's <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> like, I won permanent <laughs> abdominal pain. He's like, you should have seen the guy oh, that made God. it three weeks. <laughs> No, he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, you know, after you die, you evacuate anyway. So at least he finally got it out of his system. Oh, toxic shock. Oh, God. <laughs> Can we do a show, please? <laughs> I guess. Speaking of intense battles.